Check, check.
Committee will come to order without objection. The chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time pursuant to committee rule two, house rule 11, clause two. The chairman may postpone further proceedings today on the question of approving any, any measure or matter or adopting an amendment for which a recorded vote is ordered. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from Wyoming to lead us in the pledge. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Pursuant to notice, we call up uh, 5082, the revising existing procedures on reporting via Technology Act or the Report Act for purposes of markup and move the committee report it favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 5082 to amend Without objection, type. the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Lee, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The bill we're here to discuss today is H.R. 5082, the Revising Existing Procedures on Reporting via Technology, or Report Act. This is a strong bipartisan bill that provides additional tools to investigate and catch offenders of child sex abuse material, or CSAM. The exploitation of children through CSAM remains a serious problem, both within the United States and abroad. We have heard about these issues extensively in our two victims-focused hearings in the Crime Subcommittee, one in September and one earlier this month. Reports of CSAM continue to grow exponentially, with 3,000 reports in 1998, growing to more than 1 million in 2014 and 36.2 million in 2023. We have gaps in federal law that prevent the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or NECMEC, from preserving reports of CSAM and hinders law enforcement from finding and holding these predators accountable. With the growing reports of CSAM on the internet, NECMEC, Homeland Security Investigations, and other entities that protect children are having to make difficult decisions about which cases to prioritize. The Report Act will extend the duration for which evidence submitted to the cyber tip line is preserved from 90 days to one year. This will allow law enforcement agencies the much needed time to conduct comprehensive investigations and strengthen the legal framework against online predators. This bill would strengthen already existing law that requires providers to report as soon as reasonably possible after obtaining knowledge of CSAM. Currently, many providers maintain a sufficient reporting system. The Report Act will ensure that companies who fail to meet these standards will be penalized for failure to repeatedly report exploitative content. I'd like to thank all of the advocates who helped get us where we are today, including crafting good policy and this important bill and recognizing the landscape and the tools that law enforcement need to combat this problem. This includes the American Conservative Union, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, the International Justice Mission, Rights for Girls, PACT USA, Raven, and the Tim Tebow Foundation, and so many more. Uh, they all work tirelessly to protect and advocate on behalf of victims in both the United States and abroad. I'd also like to thank my numerous Republican colleagues who joined me in support of this bill and my colleagues across the aisle for their support of this bill, including Representative Madeline Dean, Representative Lucy McBath, Representative Glenn Ivey, and others. Finally, the law enforcement officers who tirelessly work to protect children including Homeland Security Investigations and the Internet Crimes Against Children, or ICAC, task forces across the country. Congress should aid and support them in their important work, and this act, the Report Act, does just that. It arms law enforcement with the tools they need so that all, not just some cases, of child exploitation can be prosecuted. This legislation is crucial. It is supported by law enforcement, advocacy groups, and tech companies alike. It is bipartisan, it is common sense, and it is needed. I urge my colleagues to pass the Report Act and take this important step to protect children. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. General Lady yields back. Uh, the Chair recognizes the Ranking Member for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important markup today, and thank you to our colleagues, Ms. Lee and Ms. Dean, for their tireless work on this legislation. The exploitation of children through the proliferation of child sex abuse material 
frequently referred to as CSAM, can only be stopped with cooperation across many different sectors of American society, from law enforcement and victims groups to local leaders and technology providers. With the markup and hopefully swift floor passage of the Report Act, we can strengthen the ongoing collaboration between law enforcement and technology with providers to combat the sexual exploitation of children. This legislation would also encourage much greater reporting to the cyber tip line operated by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or NICMEC. The Report Act would modify how CSAM material is stored by providers, change reporting requirements for platforms, and give law enforcement more time to investigate CSAM cases. By making these changes to the law, the Report Act will help law enforcement evolve with the threat as consumption of CSAM moves into new technological spaces. Advancements in technology, from generative AI to social networking platforms, have had clear benefits to our society. For example, cutting-edge medical and therapeutic breakthroughs are increasingly frequent. We can keep in touch with loved ones from far away, and budding entrepreneurs and artists are able to take advantage of available technologies to get up and running without costly barriers to entry, to name just a few. <coughs> Excuse me. But there is also a darker side. Law enforcement experts and victims advocates agree. Advancements in technology have also led to an explosion of CSAM available and distributed online. Horrific photographs and videos depicting depraved acts against children are now increasingly readily available through virtually every internet-based technology, including social networking platforms, file sharing sites, gaming devices, and mobile apps. And demand for new and more egregious images and videos drives the market for this material, resulting in the continued abuse and exploitation of children. Through their comprehensive efforts, the Internet Crimes Against Children, or ISAC, T task forces, which represent over 5,400 local, state, and federal law enforcement and prosecutorial agencies, are making significant strides in identifying and rescuing victims of child sex abuse material. But the growth of the problem continues to outpace the resources available to identify and locate victims, especially since law enforcement prosecutors, the tech industry, and other organizations must continually contend with the emergence of new technologies like artificial intelligence, which further complicates their efforts. Under the process for reporting CSAM today, electronic service providers or companies that offer a technology platform through which users can communicate are required to report instances of child sexual abuse material to the cyber tip line. After a tip is reported, the company works with NCMEC to share relevant information during the provider's data retention window, which is generally quite limited. NCMEC reviews incoming reports and then refers them out to the appropriate law enforcement agency, typically a regional ICAC task force. To date, NCMEC reports that the cyber tip line has received more than 92 million reports the majority of them from electronic communication service providers. Its Child Victim Identification Program has reviewed over 331 million images and videos, reviewing more than 25 million images annually. While most of the children reflected in the images remain unknown, over 19,300 victim, victims have been identified. We should certainly commend the successes of NCMEC and other law enforcement agencies in identifying rescuing victims, but we cannot be satisfied while so many CSAM victims remain unidentified. That is why the Report Act is an important first step to increasing the effectiveness of CSAM reporting and protecting victims from future abuse. The Report Act increases the amount of time a communications provider can retain suspected CSAM content and corresponding data. In doing so, it will give law enforcement more time to investigate cases and thereby to fo request follow-up information after the data retention window would normally have closed. I'm also pleased that the bill adds child trafficking to the list of required disclosures to the cyber tip line and makes changes to protect the victims who report their own cases of abuse. While I expect that this bill will garner broad bipartisan support, I am disappointed that we did not hold a hearing on the legislation itself with the opportunity to talk with NCMEC to ensure that we are making all of the changes needed to help protect victims of child abuse. A hearing can also help establish a strong record and pave the way for other bills that build upon this legislation. Finally, I would re be remiss if I failed to mention the importance of congressional funding to those agencies and organizations charged with identifying, locating, and rescuing these children. 
the collaborative efforts of federal, local, and state law enforcement agencies, along with private institutions and nonprofits, supported by federal funding and grant programs, are instrumental in identifying and rescuing victims of child sexual abuse material, as well as bringing offenders to justice and providing essential support to victims of sexual exploitation. The Senate has already passed a version of this legislation with the support of law enforcement groups, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or NICMEC, and technology providers. I hope that we will follow suit in short order and send the bill to the President. I urge members to support the bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. The chair now uh, recognizes the gentlelady from Florida for the purpose of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to Without HR. objection, the amendment in the nature of a substitute will be considered as read and shall be considered base text for the purpose of the amendment. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Florida to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment makes changes to prevent, to prevent any data security threats when the reports are stored in the cloud by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, NECMEC, then transferred electronically to law enforcement. The goal is to make sure we are adequately protecting the data. The changes in this amendment, one, secure the data in accordance with industry and government standards for cybersecurity. Two, requires NECMEC to undergo an annual independent cybersecurity audit to look for any gaps in their data security protections. And three, assures that NECMEC properly addresses all issues the audit identifies. NECMEC agrees to all of these changes. This addition was heavily negotiated and ultimately supported by both Democrats and Republicans and the Democrat-controlled Senate. In our last subcommittee hearing on child sex abuse material, uh, Chairman Biggs emphasized that he wanted to pass the Report Act in as close to perfect form as possible, and this amendment accomplishes that goal. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Um, who seeks recognition? The, we'll start here, and I think we'll come there. So we'll, the gentleman from Arizona is recognized, and we'll go to Ms. Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the, the sponsors of the bill working hard to give us a bill that's as close to perfect condition as, as possible right now, and I support the ANS and the underlying bill, as does NICMEC. And I would just remind everybody that actually we, we, we had two hearings on uh, this uh, topic. Uh, actually, the ranking member was at it uh, just about a week or so ago and uh, was able to attend. I support the bill and encourage everyone to do the same vote, yes. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. Before recognizing the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, where the, the chair is pleased to recognize the former chairman of the committee, the, 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 the good friend and gentleman from the great state of Texas, Mr. Smith, who chaired this committee a few years, a few years ago. Welcome. I know you care about all the bills, but one in particular. Uh, uh, the, the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, a co-sponsor of the legislation, a prime co-sponsor, is recognized. I move to strike the last word. Gentleman, the gentleman uh, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member, and especially thank you, Representative Lee, for all your work on this important bill. I rise in support of H.R. 5082, the Report Act. Think about it. In a 2023 report on child sexual abuse, Nick Mick reported a 329% increase in child sexual abuse files reported to its cyber tip line over a five-year period, and Nick Mick received more than 88 million child sexual abuse files in 2022 alone. Each one of these photos, videos, live streams represents the underlying record of a child's very worst experiences. With this terrible content on the rise, we must act swiftly to protect children. The Report Act, simplified, does two important things. Number one, it requires websites and social media platforms to report sex trafficking of children and enticement crimes. And number two, it would also increase penalties for failing to report this terrible exploitative content. The bill also makes uh, several much needed improvements to help NICMIC and law enforcement better address these horrific violations. As the ranking member said, and as we heard in hearings here, we must also, in addition to strengthening through the Report Act, we must put the resources toward protecting children, identifying more of the victims, and protecting children. And with that, I am pleased to be a co-sponsor of Report, and I thank Representative Lee, all the bipartisan support that we have from the Republicans, 
Uh, and the Democrats, for those who say Democrats and Republicans can't get anything done together, I'm so proud that we are recognizing the need to protect our children. Thank you, Representative Lee, for your leadership on this bipartisan issue. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The gentlelady from Texas is recognized. Mr. Chairman, uh, good morning. Let me thank the uh, chairman and ranking member of the full committee and uh, Ms. Lee for her leadership, uh, my uh, counterpart on the crime subcommittee, and Ms. Dean uh, for her commitment and leadership on this uh, issue. Um, H.R. 5082, the Report Act, would amend federal law governing the reporting of suspected child sexual exploitation and abuse offenses online. More specifically, the bill would make several improvements to the cyber tip line operated by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, an organization that many of us have worked with for many, many years, such as adding child, uh, child sex trafficking and coercion and enticement of children to the list of crimes websites and social media platforms might report increasing penalties for failure to report content, and increasing the time evidence must be preserved by uh, websites and social media platforms after it has been submitted to the cyber tip line. These changes are necessary to address the exponential growth of crimes committed against children online. Children are among our society's most precious and most vulnerable, while much progress has been made in preventing and investigating crimes against children, as well as prosecuting the offenders there is still much more to be done. As society, we continue to struggle with the existence of child exploitation, particularly online. The internet and digital services have become some of the most useful tools for child predators. In 2013, the National Center for Missing and Appointed Children, Exploited Children, also known as NICMEC, uh, received less than 1,400 cyber tips each day. In a span of only 10 years, the number of tips received each day has risen to 100,000. Under existing federal law, the electronic service providers are required to report apparent violations of certain child sexual exploitation laws found on their platforms. Currently, violations of six specific child sexual exploitation laws, including child sexual abuse material, also known as CSAM, are subject to the reporting requirement. Reports are, are made to the cyber tip line, a hotline run by NICMAC, which then transmits these reports to the appropriate law enforcement. Pursuant to this clearinghouse function, NICMAC is generally immune from liability for the possession and transmission of CSAM that would otherwise be illegal. After making a cyber tip line report, providers must preserve the reported content for 90 days before deleting it. And due to rapid change in technology, online child exploitation offenses are increasing in scale. And so uh, this uh, amendment and addition uh, to this legislation uh, takes this a long way. Although reporting from law enforcement, child advocates, and child protection organizations show that child sex trafficking and online coercion and enticement are on the rise. These crimes are currently not subject to federal reporting requirements. The Report Act would add these reprehensible crimes to the reporting obligations of service providers. To ensure providers take this responsibility seriously, the bill would increase the penalties to, uh, for the knowing and willful range to report from a range of 150,000 to 300,000, to range from 600,000 to 1 million, depending on the size of the provider and whether uh, the provider is, um, is a repeat offender. Uh, this is clearly uh, an important, this is clearly an important effort and opportunity uh, to do better by our children. While I'm on this uh, case, uh, let me remind my colleagues of the work we still have to do, which is H.R. 30, the Bipartisan Stop Human Trafficking in School Zones, uh, introduced uh, by M Michael McCall, myself, and Representative Nadler. And this particularly focuses uh, on online, uh, but as well, it has the aspect of dealing with the physical enticement and recruitment of children right out of their classroom, right by classmates. And so this legislation would establish a sentencing enhancement of up to five years for any person who commits human trafficking offenses and other sex offenses. We can do always more, and I applaud the Report Act and look forward to my colleagues joining me in working on H.R. 30 as well, specifically dealing with human trafficking. And with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I yield back, and I too would like to acknowledge, uh, and he may have gone, but my former chairman and fellow Texan, uh, Chairman Smith, it's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you.
Chairman, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Who seeks recognition? Gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. McBath was in the queue first. The, yes. the gentlelady from uh, Georgia is recognized. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Jordan and Ranking Member Nadler. And um, I'm just so excited. Thank you to Representative uh, Lee. Thank you very, very much for asking me to participate in this really important piece of legislation. Because above all else, I'm just a mom, um, which is why I speak today in, re in, in support of the Report Act. What else is as precious as our children? The love that we feel for our children is deeper than any that I've ever known, and I'm sure any parent in here feels exactly the same way. And even if we lose our children, as I have, that love lives on in us and pulls us to do our very best to keep our children and other children safe. The legislation before us today will be implemented to, to, to support child victims, help law enforcement bring missing children home, and protect our future generations from these horrors. I saw the need for stronger laws to eliminate the spread of child sexual abuse material, so I introduced the End Child Exploitation Act. My bill empowers our law enforcement to conduct comprehensive, thorough investigations without their evidence being prematurely thrown out. And I am proud to say that my bill is included in the piece of legislation that we are discussing today, along with other important guidelines that support our law enforcement to find these children and to prosecute their abusers. It's a dangerous reality that inappropriate, disgusting material can be shared across the globe while those uploading and recording the material can easily disappear. Our children are at risk. Just last week, a story published in the Washington Post ex explained the turmoil of a young 14-year-old girl who experienced and what she experienced after she was coerced and exploited by an online group of predators into sending and live streaming explicit material. Sadly, this is all too common and happening every single day on our social media applications and websites that are readily made available to our children. This is exactly why the Report Act is so sorely needed and why I am so very proud to support it. We must take care of our most precious, precious resource, and that is our children. They are our future. And as parents and our community leaders, members of Congress, we must do everything that we can to protect and support and uplift them. And I yield back the remainder of my time. Gentlelady yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to uh, associate myself with the remarks of uh, my colleagues who've come before. I certainly want to uh, take a moment to uh, strongly support uh, this piece of legislation. I want to commend uh, my fellow former prosecutor, Ms. Lee, uh, for her outstanding leadership in this uh, legislative effort. And also Ms. Dean, who I think has been uh, doing a great job on this front. I want to thank Ms. McBath for her leadership and allowing me to join in the provision that's been included in this bill, Section 3. Um, and I, Chairman, I, I want to thank you for, for bringing this bill forward. Uh, and with that, uh, I know you'll be surprised that I'm this brief, Mr. Chairman, but I want to uh, thank my colleagues, urge them to support this bill, and yield back. Gentleman yields back. Question is on the adoption of the amendment in the nature of a substitute. This will be followed immediately by a vote on reporting the bill. All those in favor say, Aye. Aye. Uh, those opposed, no. Pin the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment in the nature of a substitute is adopted, a reporting quorum being present. The question is on favorably reporting the bill as amended. I was looking around to make sure there's a quorum present. Uh, when we do have that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, the bill is ordered to be reported. What, the, the request for recorded votes, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Issa. Aye. Mr. Issa votes aye. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Biggs. 
Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Massey. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Roy. Mr. Bishop. Ms. Sparks. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Bentz. Mr. Klein. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong votes yes. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Van Drew. Mr. Nels. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes yes. Mr. Kiley. Ms. Hageman. Yes. Ms. Hageman votes yes. Mr. Moran. Ms. Lee. Aye. Ms. Lee votes aye. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Fry. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee. Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Liu. Ms. Jayapal. Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Mr. Correa. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Nagoose. Ms. McBath. Ms. McBath votes aye. Ms. Dean. Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Escobar. Ms. Ross. Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivy. Aye. Mr. Ivy votes aye. Ms. Ballant. Aye. Ms. Ballant votes aye. Gentlemen, gentlemen from Florida. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates votes aye. Two more. Did you make two votes at the Did Ms. Ballant vote? Did she vote no? Mm -hmm. She voted no. Okay. Okay. Gentlelady from Texas. Ms. Escobar votes yes. Mr. Klein, Mr. Klein votes yes. Clerk will report.
Mr. Chairman, there are 23 ayes and zero noes. The ayes have it, and the bill is ordered to be reported favorably to the House. Members will have two days to submit views without objection. The bill will be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute incorporating all adopted amendments, and staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes. Pursuant to notice, I call up H.R. 7187, the Protection of Women in Olympic and Amateur Sports Act for purposes of a markup, and move the committee reported favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 7187. Without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Wyoming, Ms. Hegeman, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The bill we are here to discuss today is H.R. 7187, the Protection of Women in Olympic and Amateur Sports Act. The purpose of this legislation is simple. It modifies eligibility requirements for amateur sports governing organizations. Specifically, this bill adds clear definitions of men and women in the Ted Stevens Olympic and Amateur Sports Act. It further states that biological men cannot participate in competitions designated for biological women and girls. Oh, Ensuring equal rights for women has been a long and hard fought battle. However, every day we are seeing egregious examples of men increasingly intruding into protected spaces for women. From female swimmers being forced to both compete and change in the locker room with the man who changed his name to Leah Thomas, to the recent decision by the USA Boxing to update their rule book to include a transgender policy, women and girls are being pushed aside and given no voice in the matter. A recent decision by USA Boxing is particularly troubling. In a sport where the purpose of the competition is to strike your opponent, USA Boxing is permitting men to punch women. Not only will women be forced out of titles and championships in boxing, but they will risk serious injury. Look no further than the tragic story of Peyton McNabb. In 2022, Peyton, now an independent women's voice ambassador, was a volleyball player competing at her high school in North Carolina. A man playing on the opposite girl's team spiked the ball into her face and head. And I would urge all of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to watch the video to see what they are advocating for. Peyton was knocked unconscious and is still dealing with long-lasting injuries from this incident, including impaired vision and partial paralysis on her right side. To those who deny the existence of this issue, it is very real, and women and girls are getting hurt. The left will stop at nothing until women and girls' sports are erased and eradicated. Let me be clear. Congress must act to protect these rights and opportunities that women fought so long for. Let's take this common sense approach to protect women and girls. Thank you, and I yield back. General Lee, it's back. The, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from, uh, the ranking member for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, H.R. 7187, the so-called Protection of Women in Olympic and Amateur Sports Act, is a cynical and dangerous measure. This bill would force the national governing bodies, or NGBs, of various amateur sports to adopt exclusionary transgender policies or face losing their status as an NGB in their respective sport. This legislation is yet another ugly attempt by Republicans to bully an already vulnerable minority of trans youth athletes for political gain. To begin, this legislation is the solution in search of a problem. The International Olympics Committee has permitted transgender athletes to compete since 2003, yet only a handful of trans athletes have ever been qualified for an Olympic event, and the U.S. has only ever sent one transgender woman to the Olympics, as an alternate who ultimately did not compete. Under the current system, NGBs determine their own inclusion policies, which vary from sport to sport and which continue to evolve. For example, boxers are not subject to the same transgender inclusion policies as equestrians. Indeed, USA Boxing recently announced that trans women are eligible to compete in women's events, but they are subject to the most stringent requirements of any sport with a documented policy. NGBs and the people closest on the ground, to the ground on this issue should be left to develop fair and inclusive policies. They do not need Congress to interfere especially a Republican majority more interested in fear-mongering and demagoguing than actually protecting women. This bill would have us replace transgender inclusion policies that are currently determined on a sport-by-sport -sport basis with a one-size-fits-all ban. MAGA Republicans may crow 
that they have excluded a handful of trans athletes from amateur athletic competitions, but they will not have improved the lives of any of the competitors. This blanket ban may appeal to the Republican MAGA base, but it has no basis in fact, performance outcomes, or basic human decency. In fact, the blanket ban on transgender women athletes will harm all women and girls who participate in amateur athletic competitions. This bill would likely lead to invasive screening procedures to verify an athlete's gender. This is particularly concerning considering the various sexual abuse scandals afflicting sports, like that involving Larry Nasser, a doctor for the U.S. Women's National Gymnastics Team who pled guilty to offenses relating to the sexual abuse of minors, and whose case is considered one of the worst sexual abuse scandals in sports history. The invasive screening invited by this bill would potentially create opportunities ripe for abusers. Spare me the Republican crocodile tears about protecting women and girls in sports. If Republicans were truly interested in protecting women and girls or ensuring equal opportunity, they would address the real barriers to women's equality in sports rather than targeting trans women and girls to further their political agenda. A recent report by the Women's Sports Foundation found actual verifiable barriers to women's and girls' sports equality including a lack of financial resources, gender role stereotypes, vulnerability to abuse, and workplace bias and wage gaps. Notably missing from the list, the inclusion of transgender women. This legislation's effects on women's and girls' amateur sports alone is reason enough to oppose it. Yet the negative effect, impact of this bill is not limited to a subset of elite athletes and amateur athletic competitions. It would also cause additional harm to the small, vulnerable community of trans youth athletes that have already been bullied out of scholastic sports by the MAGA Republicans in control of red state legislatures. If passed, this bill would lead to a trickle-down effect throughout an NGB's network of amateur, sports asso amateur associations and sponsored competitions. Because nearly half of all states already categorically banned trans women and girls from scholastic sports, Trans youth will be denied the last avenue to organize athletic participation available to them, along with all the social, academic, and health benefits organized sports provide. For example, in Chairman Jordan's home state of Ohio, the state legislature recently enacted a ban on transgender women and girls participating in scholastic sports competitions that match their gender identity over the veto of Republican Governor Mike DeWine. This spiteful measure has the dubious honor of affecting virtually nobody in the state and being appallingly cruel to the few people it does affect. In 2023, there were only six, count them, six transgender girls participating in sports programs for grades through seven through 12 out of 400,000 student athletes in Ohio at the time, a minuscule percentage of the population. And we know from reporting that none of those children posed a threat to the chairman and his allies. They just wanted to play in a team with their friends. We hear additional ugly stories from other Republican-run states. And unfortunately, my Republican colleagues here want to export that needless cruelty to every state in the nation. In short, this legislation is an unnecessary, bigoted, and frankly, petty exercise of congressional power. I urge all members to oppose it, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman, <coughs> excuse me, the gentleman yields back. <coughs> the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Wyoming for the purpose of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, ha I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7187 offered by Ms. Hageman of Wyoming. Strike all after Without the Without objection, the amendment in the nature of a substitute will be considered as read and shall be considered as base text for the purposes of amendment. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Wyoming to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, this amendment makes a small change to the short title and does nothing to alter the substance of the bill. I urge my colleagues to support it and I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. Gentlelady from Washington is recognized. I have an amendment at the desk. Gentlelady, uh, the clerk will report. Gentleman from Florida reserves a point. Or uh, Arizona reserves point of order. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 7187 offered by Ms. Jayapal. Page two. Objection. The amendment will be considered as read. The gentlelady is recognized to uh, explain her amendment. 
Mr. Chairman, I'm deeply disappointed. I'm not surprised, but I'm deeply disappointed that my Republican colleagues have brought this harmful bill to a markup to attack the transgender community one more time. The way this bill targets trans people in the name of gender equality is simply insulting. Don't believe for a second that this is about protecting women and girls. My amendment would require a report on the impacts of this bill on all female athletes since categorical bans on trans women harm all women. That is why women's organizations across the country, including the Women's Sports Foundation, have denounced categorical bans on trans athletes for promoting fear, dangerous stereotypes, unfair scrutiny on high-performing female athletes, and sex di discrimination based on misinformation. And just think about this for a second. How are you going to enforce this ban? How do you verify a girl or a woman's, quote, reproductive anatomy? We have already seen horrific sexual abuse against girls and women in sports. If a woman or a young girl, if your daughter, your daughter doesn't look feminine enough, is she subject to an examination? This is absurd and insulting. Instead of focusing on the real issues that female athletes face, including a lack of financial resources, vulnerability to abuse and wage gaps, Republicans are instead choosing to appropriate the rhetoric, just the rhetoric of women's rights to obscure what seems to be a deeply felt hate for gender inclusivity and prejudice against the trans community. Time and time again, Republicans have refused to work with Democrats to work on legislation that would meaningfully protect and support women and girls. Let's just take a quick look at the track record. Last Congress, House Democrats passed the Paycheck Fairness Act to combat gender-based wage discrimination, and one Republican voted for it. We passed the Women's Health Protection Act to protect abortion access twice, and each time not a single Republican voted for it. And now many Republicans won't even stand up to attacks on IVF. Instead of protecting women, Republicans are focused on limiting women's rights and autonomy. They have supported nationwide abortion bans, and now they're trying to ban trans athletes against the guidance of international athletic institutions that have long recognized categorical bans are unnecessary to achieve fairness. Now, I want to be clear. The International Olympic Committee has allowed transgender women to compete in the Olympics since 2003. And since then, only one, one transgender woman has ever gone to the Olympics. That's right, one. And, by the way, she was an alternate. One of the things I want to point out here is that of the estimated 332 million people in the United States that identify uh, as transgender, 1.3 million adults and youth 13 to 17 who identify as transgender, this is a tiny, tiny portion of the population. In fact, it's one half of 1% of adults and youth between the ages of 13 and 17, and 1.4% of the entire population. That's what we're spending all this time on with these trans bans. The IOC's own framework on fairness and inclusion states, and this is a quote, no athlete should be excluded from competition on the exclusive ground of an unverified, alleged, or perceived unfair competitive advantage due to their transgender status. That is why the IOC defers to the governing body of each sport to determine eligibility requirements. And in line with the IOC recommendations, national governing boards have developed policies that allow for the inclusion of trans athletes. Recognizing the fact that categorical bans aren't needed to preserve fairness as, one, as no one factor determines an athlete's abilities. All this conversation does is stoke prejudice and embolden people to discriminate. Almost half of transgender people in the United States will attempt suicide at least once in their life. And trans people are over four times more likely than cisgender people to experience violent victimization. These bills directly harm some of the most vulnerable people in this country and tell them that they don't belong. I am the proud mother of a trans daughter. And every time these bills come up, I ask you to think about what it would be like if your daughter was the one that you were talking about. What would it be like 
if you were telling your daughter that she does not have the right to be who she is. Every one of you has children. I ask you to please stop targeting our trans community that is already vulnerable, that already faces so many challenges. Why are you doing this? It is a tiny portion of people across the country that identify as trans, and not a single one of them is doing anything to harm you or your family. Stop it. Stop it. We have better things to do in Congress, things that could actually lift people up across this country. Vote yes on my amendment and no on this horrific bill. I yield back. Gentlelady yields, um, gentlelady yields back. Um, the, the, chair, the chair recognizes the gentlelady from uh, Wyoming. Um, I think it's very clear why, we're, why we are doing this bill, and that is to protect women and, and girls in sports. Uh, I do not believe that this amendment is germane to the underlying bill. The very purpose of the bill is to state that these uh, organizations cannot allow men to participate in girls' athletics. Um, if, she, if, if, if the uh, author of this amendment would like to bring her own standalone bill, I think that that is a more appropriate way to address this. But I do not believe that this amendment is germane to the underlying bill or the purpose of what we're doing. Mr. Chairman. General Lady yields back, the, uh, the ranking members recognize. Can you get me on Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This, first of all, this amendment certainly is germane. It goes to the heart of the evil bill that we are considering, and I strongly support it. The gentlelady from Wyoming talked about men competing in women's sports. Men do not compete in women's sports. Transgender women may compete in women's sports. It does no service to the truth or to human biology or understanding of human biology to maintain that there's no such thing as transgender women, or for that matter, transgender men. There most certainly are. We know that. We see that. People did not ask to be born transgender any more than any of us asked to be born male or female. They just were born that way. And now we have this bill that wants to punish them for it. I strongly, I strongly oppose the bill. I support the amendment. The amendment would require NGBs to commit to submitting annual reports to the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee describing the impact of prohibiting transgender women and girls from participation in an amateur athletic competition on the participation of women and girls in those amateur athletic competitions. As I mentioned in my opening statement, I oppose this legislation in part because its blanket ban will harm all women and girls, in addition to all transgender women and girls. This blanket ban will likely subject all women and girls to unfair scrutiny of their gender identity, to physical inspections, if not lead to outright subjecting them to invasive screening procedures. It also would likely lead to increased harassment of any other person perceived by anyone as not conforming to harmful and discriminatory stereotypes based on some people's expectations of femininity. I have no doubt that this increased scrutiny and harassment will have a negative impact on all women and girls' participation in amateur athletic competitions. I think it important that the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee and the public be made aware of the costs imposed on all women and girls when transgender women and girls are targeted for discrimination, such, should such an immoral, awful bill ever become law. While I still would not support the underlying legislation if, if adopted, I would urge members to support this amendment. It slightly improves an awful, evil piece of legislation. I urge the adoption of the amendment and the defeat of the bill. Uh, the gentleman yields back. The question occurs. Oh, Ms. Jackson Lee, I'm sorry. Point of order is withdrawn. Ms. Jackson Lee is recognized. Well, I thought that uh, Chairman uh, Diggs was going to offer his support for the legislation. I was going to yield to him. Uh, he supports the legislation. He probably doesn't support the amendment. Uh, and, and uh, well, in particular, this, this amendment. Let, let, let me, um, uh, I don't even want to get into the weeds of the details 
of a very fine amendment. What I think um, is the crux of the wrongness of our presence here today in the underlying bill is a very attack on humanity. And it has been my understanding, being in the judiciary in this room and being on this committee uh, for two decades plus, that our basic infrastructure is to improve and enhance the conditions of humanity. We use the Constitution in some instances, very proud document that we utilize as members of the Subcommittee on Constitutional Law that deal with the basic uh, life of Americans. Uh, it governs whether we have equal protection of the law. It governs whether or not we can be in the courtroom. It governs whether or not our race will discriminate against us. It governs whether our language will discriminate, uh, will be a basis for discrimination. Um, and uh, we could argue our, our sexual orientation. But our proposition is that it is to make human life better. This bill attacks humanity, attacks the very dignity of acts or conditions that one cannot change. You are a human being that has this description. You cannot change it. Your loving daughter is a loving daughter and one of our human family. And our job is to make her life a life where she is applauded in this nation as part of the extended human family. Why would we even entertain legislation that is denigrating, denying, destroying the life of a population of people. The trans community exists. They are children, they are adults, and God, if they have not been killed, they are now aging, many of whom have lived in the shadows of life only to protect themselves from being attacked. So my argument, Mr. Chairman, is for you to even have brought this bill up. This is not a bill that should be on the roster for the Judiciary Committee. This is a bill that is destructive. And if there are particular cases that need to be addressed so that there is fairness, I wrote the legislation, the anti-doping legislation, proud to have that signed uh, dealing with the Olympics to stop doping in the Olympics, signed by President Trump, to enhance the quality of performance, and when I say performance, the level of uh, equality in the Olympics. Someone would not have drugs in their system, enhancing drugs. But this does nothing. And if there is a case, as I think my colleague from Washington State said, if there's a case, these have either been handled or they should be handled. So frankly, I'm appalled. Underlying, I am hurt. Because in this instance, I can place myself in the categories of the 20th century and now the 21st when race denigrated me. I'm still in that category, but when it was severely used to denigrate me, I could not vote. I could not sit on a bus in the front. I could not ride a train as a little girl. I had to ride in the colored person's train, a kaboot, whatever it was, as I traveled to visit my grandparents with a brown bag of food because I could not eat where they served food. I traveled as a nine-year-old. As my parents put me on the train, they had to explain to make it fun that I was in this car versus another place of seating. My ticket didn't cost any less. And so I respectfully ask that this legislation be withdrawn from the roster. I ask unanimous consent, because it has no place on this particular set of legislation. Gentleman from Kentucky. None. Gentleman. And with that, Mr. Chair, I, I, I ask unanimous consent that the 
bill be withdrawn. Gentleman, gentleman from Kentucky objects. Um, gentlelady's time I is yield. expired. The gentleman, I yield. gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. Uh, I move, Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentleman, and, gentleman can proceed. And I um, like to yield time to Ms. Hageman from Wyoming. Thank you, Mr. Massey. Um, there is really no discussion so far on the actual bill. There's a lot of emotional language and a lot of accusations being made by my colleagues on the other side, but no discussion about the uh, need for the bill that we are debating at this time. In terms of the amendment, I would like to point out to uh, my colleague from New York, as he read the amendment, he actually changed the language of what is stated in the bill in order to make a point. Uh, because he recognized that the, that the word that is in this amendment actually completely undermines every single thing that he said. According to the amendment, it would insert the line, commits to submitting annual reports to the corporation that include for each calendar year a report describing the impact of prohibiting a person whose sex is male from participating in an amateur athletic competition that is designated for females, women, or girls on the participation of females, women, or girls in that amateur athletic competition. So the very purpose of this amendment is to do a report on the impact of allowing men to compete against women um, and, and have a, a requirement for that annual report. I think that I can tell you what that annual report would show and that that would be that every time that a man competes against a woman, or virtually every time, they're probably going to beat them. So I don't know that we need that, that report. I, I oppose this amendment for that reason alone, but I would ask that in the future when you are reading the amendment, you actually read what is stated rather than what you wish was stated and then arguing against that. It's a classic straw man argument. Um, on the other side, there have been discussion about invasive screening procedures and that if we adopt this, our bill, that there would have to be invasive screening procedures. In other words, this accusation that for any woman who was competing in athletics, they would have to be subjected to a physical examination. First of all, it's a red herring, it's stupid as all get out, and it's just absolutely not what has happened historically. But I would point to the policy by the US Boxing uh, uh, Association, which actually requires that very kind of screening. Um, it must state that the boxer who transitions from male to female is eligible to compete in the female category under the following conditions. The athlete has declared that her gender identity is female and has completed gender reassignment surgery. I would assume that the only way they're going to be able to determine that is if they actually physically examine these people to determine whether in fact they have been castrated, which I find to be an absolutely uh, absurd position to be taking uh, by the Boxing Association. Um, I, I would also say I, I do not need to be lectured by a man on the issue of protecting women and girls in sports or what a woman actually is. I know that. I, I know what a woman is. I do not need to be lectured that we, that somehow by saying that men cannot compete against women, we are hurting women and girls. That is an insult to women and girls. It is an insult to me personally that you believe that I am not capable of understanding the difference between women and girls and men and boys. Um, I also believe that the entire argument is focusing not on the issue at hand, again, whether men and boys should be able to compete against women and girls in the Olympics, which is all that this bill does. I would ask unanimous consent to submit for the record the instances of men hijacking women's sports and the various uh, uh, examples that we have demonstrating not only the injuries that have been suffered by women as men have participated in, in, in girls' sports, but also the women who ha girls and women who have been affected by this, including uh, 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 Riley Gaines when Will Thomas de decided to, to join the the, female, the women's uh, swimming team in Pens uh, Pennsylvania. Again, this bill Not is objection. I object to concluding these mistruths in the record. There's an objection. Okay. I think that speaks volumes as well. If you do not want in the record the information about the impact.
that men are having on female on women's athletes. I would also submit for the ask for unanimous consent to submit to the record three articles: USA Boxing Slam for new transgender policy that allows biological men to compete against women. Objection. Boxing champs, Olympic gold medalist, rip USA Boxing over transgender policy. Girls need to stick together. And USA Boxing codifies rule allowing male participation in women's division. Without objection. Gentlelady's time has expired. Yield back. The gentlelady from Georgia is recognized. <clears throat> Thank you. I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady can proceed. I find it extremely distressing that we find it okay in this body to be able to bully our trans youth for political gain. I'm speaking in opposition to this bill in its entirety. I do support, however, Ms. Paul's amendment. Like most amateur athletes, generally most trans athletes do not compete on elite levels. This bill imposes a blanket ban on amateur competition anyway because nearly half of the states have already banned trans women and girls from scholastic sports, this bill would deny trans youth the very last avenue that they have to athletic participation that's actually available to them, along with all the social, all the academic and health benefits organized sports provide for them. So I find it very distressing that we are targeting our young people, we are targeting our children. And I just think that we should be doing everything that we can to uplift them. That's what we're talking about today, supporting them, uplifting them emotionally, psychologically, physically. That is our role. And I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The uh, gentlelady from Vermont is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you. Uh, at the top, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a uh, New York Times article from June 2023, how the GOP picked trans kids as a rallying cry. Objection. Gentleman objects. So, here we are, spending time once again, using our valuable time to pick on a class of people in this country. I believe I'm the only person on this committee who represents the LGBTQ community, though I always say that we know of. And I have to tell you, I've been absolutely stunned by the amount of time and energy that we have spent in this Congress talking about trans kids, their parents, gay Americans, that somehow my community is the source of all that is wrong in this country. And I want to associate myself with the remarks of uh, Ms. Jackson Lee from Texas and Ms. Jayapal from Washington. This is about basic humanity. This is about dignity. And it is no secret, if you are paying attention, that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have decided that this congressional term would be about bringing up the issue of trans kids and their families and gay Americans relentlessly. Amendments and bills and riders constantly, as if we have nothing better to do than to demonize our fellow citizens, because that's what we're talking about here. It's about constantly trying to get Americans to hate one another. It is about dehumanizing Children, children, and as a former teacher, I can tell you, it is hard enough to be an adolescent without getting all of these messages from our elected officials. 
that somehow they are not worthy, they are not loved. And some of the rhetoric that I hear right now in this body is about making them less than human. And all they want to do is live their lives, attend school, have friends, participate in sports, know that their government is not using every opportunity to fan the flames of fear and hatred. Now, I understand that there are some people in this room and in this, this body as a whole that may actually believe the rhetoric, may actually believe that you are doing good. But I'm telling you, it has a devastating effect on children, on teens, and their parents. In this committee, we had a hearing on trans kids generally and the danger, essentially, they were to the American way of life. And right there in that seat, we had a, a conservative Republican woman who came to talk about her experience trying to raise her trans kid and what it felt like for her to sit in this body and have members of her own party try to tre treat her as if she were somehow doing damage to her, ch her child by simply trying to hold her for all that she was. I don't believe that you think you're doing real damage, but I'm telling you, you are. This is not how we should be spending our time. We should be spending our time uplifting Americans, alleviating suffering, letting Americans know that we believe in them and we support them. And not this, this fear-mongering, this constant fear-mongering in this Congress. People who just want to live their lives and the families who love them. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The question, question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from Washington. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no, no. In the opinion of the chairs, the noes have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. A roll call being requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan? No. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Issa? Mr. Buck? Mr. Gates? Mr. Biggs? Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock? Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany? Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey? No. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy? Mr. Bishop? Ms. Sparts? Mr. Fitzgerald? No. Mr. Fitzgerald votes no. Mr. Bentz? Mr. Klein, Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Armstrong votes no. Mr. Gooden, no. Mr. Gooden votes no. Mr. Van Drew, Mr. Nels, Mr. Moore, Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley, Mr. Kiley votes no. Ms. Hageman, no. Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran, no. Ms. Moran votes no. Ms. Lee, no. Ms. Lee votes no. Mr. Hunt, Mr. Fry, Mr. Nadler. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren? Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee? Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen? Mr. Johnson? Mr. Schiff? Mr. Swalwell? Mr. Liu? Ms. Jayapal? Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Mr. Correa? Ms. Scanlon? Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Nagus? Ms. McBath, Ms. McBath votes aye. Ms. Dean, Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Escobar, Ms. Escobar votes aye. Ms. Ross, Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush, Mr. Ivy, Mr. Ivy votes aye. Ms. Ballant, Ms. Ballant votes aye. Clerk will. Mm -hmm. 
think they had 10 or, felt like it was 10 or 11. Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 11 ayes and 13 noes. The amendment is not adopted. I have an amendment at the desk. Gentle lady from uh, Texas will, uh, well, clerk will report. Gentleman from Arizona reserves point of order. Substitute for the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7187 offered not by Ms. Jackson. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentlelady from Texas is recognized to uh, explain her amendment. Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much. I, I do do this um, not to be partisan or to, not to take seriously the amendment process. I've already indicated that this is an attack on humanity uh, and really has no place here today. Uh, my amendment would... Uh, in essence, substitute uh, the present language of 7187 for H.R. 4960, the China Gibson Stop the Transgender Murder Epidemic, which speaks to the rampant killing of women, transgender women, uh, throughout America for a period of time. Uh, this is to make an important point and to send a clear message to the American people that we should not be supporting and uplifting those who uh, are marginalized and discriminated against. We should not be uplifting persons who would marginalize and discriminate against uh, individuals who are in the trans community. And we should be especially mindful of protecting individuals whose very existence subjects them to violence and murder. Specifically, my bill, H.R. 4960, or the new 7187, uh, would establish a commission uh, to study uh, the, and develop proposals to combat the epidemic that is the murder of transgender, gender nonconforming, gender expansive, and transgender women of color. This bill is named after and in honor of a transgender woman who was tragically murdered on February 25, 2017, while she was in New Orleans celebrating Mardi Gras. It is a tragedy and epidemic what is happening to transgender black women uh, who are being murdered across this country at a rate that is seven times higher than the general population. In 2018, 26 transgender people were violently killed in the U.S., with the majority of them being black transgender, transgender women. In 2022, at least 34 transgender or gender nonconforming people were fatally shot or violently murdered. And so instead of marking up a dangerously discriminatory and harmful bill uh, excluding uh, transgender women, a measure that can surely amplify hate crimes. So instead of, uh, let me correct that, instead of marking up a bill that would attack dangerous behavior and discriminatory behavior, we should be um, focused on what will help humanity and help people who are themselves, who are described as human beings. We must establish a commission to document and research issues, gender conforming, gender expansive, and transgender women of color Face, such as limited access to health care, public and private discrimination against this population, overshadowing the risk factors uh, that the community faces. I met uh, the family members and supportive community of this wonderful young woman who had every right to live, and her death is attributable only to her condition, only to her condition, not that anything that she did, not at all. Uh, and she was a lovely young woman. Texas transgender women's killing highlights the disturbing trend. And so we need to make appropriate recommendations on how to educate the American public, how federal laws can uplift humanity, cannot stigmatize, can protect people who've lost loved ones. I'm not against harsh laws that will punish those who've done ill to others. We need to come together on how we do that in a way that we protect families. Uh, but the categorical banning on transgender women, athletes, and children are simply outrageous, and young women. In particular, H.R. 7871 does nothing to address actual barriers to women's equality in sports. It does nothing to help uh, my, my sister from the state of Washington, her beautiful daughter, her family, the unity of her family, the love of her family. It does nothing to create a pathway for people whose humanity is different from mine. If Republican members really cared, they would offer a bill that provides solutions to women's sports equality and not spark fear 
against a vulnerable community. H.R. 7187 is simply, again, the Republicans' pathway to victory in November 2024. Let's find a group that we can categorize, demonize, and have everybody saying that if we vote for the other guys, they're going to support the demons that are out to get us. They're not out to get us. They're part of our extended family. And H.R. 7187 is simply the Republicans' popularity contest of bullying trans youth and stoking fear against transgender people. There have been 1,500 anti-LGBT uh, bills over the uh, couple of years. Republicans have set the record for the fourth year in a row with 589 bills introduced in 2023. In state legislature, 174. We cannot stand by, Mr. Chairman. I don't think you want to stand by and do this. The Biden administration is opposed to this kind of language. No group has come to us and asked for this language. I stand ready to fight against this bill. I will not tolerate it. I have had this horrible experience of discrimination, the fear, the hatred. I will not have it. And so I ask my colleagues to support the Jackson Lee Amendment. Gentlelady uh, yields back. Does the gentleman from Arizona insist on his point of order? <coughs> yes, Mr. Chairman, I do. Uh, the, general, uh, the gentleman insists on his point of order. Does the gentlelady wish to respond on the germaneness point of order? I, abs I, I, I absolutely do, Mr. I Chairman. I expect so. Um, this uh, underlying bill uh, deals specifically with the trans community, uh, though it may uh, be dealing with uh, athletics. Um, this now. is um, a folder full of articles about the attacks on transgender, uh, in particularly African-American women. Uh, but in particular, it goes to all aspects of their life. Athletics is a part of your life. And so I believe that this amendment is an appropriate ANS, ANS rather, uh, for the mission of this uh, committee. This committee's mission is to use our laws to protect and uplift not to discriminate, tear apart, and tear under. As we would say in places of worship, tear us under. It is to lift us up. It is to find ways to protect vulnerable populations. The trans community is a vulnerable population that should be protected. And I would argue that it is germane on the basis of the constitutional protections uh, that my amendment would provide, as opposed to the constitutional uh, conditions that would be torn down under the present 7187 as it's presently written. Uh, I maintain that it is germane. The, uh, the chair is prepared to rule. Uh, uh, no one supports a tax on anybody, uh, but the gentlewoman's uh, amendment does not satisfy the subject matter and fundamental purpose test. Therefore, it is not germane and is out of order. And Mr. Chairman, I move to adjourn. Mr. Chairman, I move to adjourn. The gentlelady has a motion to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. Roll call. In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. A roll call being requested. The clerk will call the roll on the motion to adjourn. Mr. Jordan. No. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Isa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Buck votes no. Mr. Gates. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey? Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy? Mr. Bishop? Ms. Sparts? Ms. Sparts votes no. Mr. Fitzgerald? Mr. Benz? Mr. Benz votes no. Mr. Klein? Mr. Armstrong? Mr. Armstrong votes no. Mr. Gooden? Mr. Gooden votes no. Mr. Van Drew? Mr. Nels, Mr. Moore, Mr. Kiley, Mr. Kiley votes no. Ms. Hageman, no. Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran, no. Mr. Moran votes no. Ms. Lee, Mr. Hunt, good, Mr. Fry, Thomas. Mr. Nadler, uh, aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren, aye. Ms. Lof Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee, aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Schiff, Mr. Swalwell, Mr. Liu, Ms. Jayapal, aye. Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Mr. Correa, Ms. Scanlon, aye. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Nagoose, Ms. McBath, 
Ms. McBath votes aye. Ms. Dean? Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Escobar? Ms. Ross? Ms. Bush? Mr. Ivey? Mr. Ivey votes aye. Ms. Ballant? Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Chairman, there are eight ayes and 14 noes. Uh, the, the motion is not agreed to. Uh, who seeks recognition? The gentlelady from uh, Indiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speak on the, to speak on the bill. On the bill. I move to strike the last vote. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I rise in strong support of this bill, and I'll tell you something. Um, it's really sad for me to see that the other side has said they also protect women and women's rights. It's really, you know, not protected this rights for women, you know, and girls to be competitive in sports. And I'm talking as a woman who's been in very male-dominated professions all my life, whether it was farming, commercial real estate, large finances, and politics. It is extremely hard if you are a woman, independent thinker, and someone who is not a puppet to the establishment of your party to survive. You know, especially in politics where we have, you know, a lot of men, you know, that I would call, you know, a lot of pricks with no balls, but attack the women. And it's, uh, yeah, that's why I'm a big supporter of, you know, of Second Amendment rights, which is the ultimate equalizer, because ultimately, let's just be honest, you know, physically, we are not as strong as a man. You know, when we have Second Amendment, it makes us equal. And that is why it is a quality right, Second Amendment, I truly believe. You know, and for me, it's sad to see I'm also a mother of two girls that we are actually trying to put girls in disadvantage. And a lot of these girls work extremely, extremely hard to be able to succeed in the sport. It's very competitive. Sometimes even, you know, probably spend too much of their energy and don't even have time for academics. But, but truly, it's, for me, it's very offensive to see that we have actually men who were, you know, biological sex males now competing against these girls. Let's just be honest, whether we're playing golf or other things, we have for a reason. We have a different place where girls hit the ball, you know, which is a reason for that. And it's sad for me to see that on this issue we become politicized, you know, and not protecting actually girls' abilities to, and, and celebrate successes and win. And now we even have biological male going into sports. Well, they're already like tough on any other industries, good old boys clubs everywhere. And I hope the other side will start politicizing. There is no one here saying that we should be promoting any violence. No violence against anyone should be. People have their rights to do whatever they want, you know, even craziest things unless they want to hurt someone else. But this is actually can hurt women in the sports and we have, you know, accidents happen in that. It limits the ability for women and girls to, to win and succeed. And it also really undermines us as women, which we really should be promoting women because it brings so much diversity, brings so much different opinions, and we as a mother should be part of all of these successes. So I think this is really disgraceful for me that we have attack on the women we now have biologically born males, now even in sports. So I strongly urge my colleagues to support this bill for all of the women that are very tough. If you really care about us mothers and women, I hope you will support it. And I hope people on the other side stop politicizing this issue because this is really an issue of equality for women. And if we were talking about equality of rights and opportunities in these countries, this is actually the bill that brings opportunities for some of these girls that work extremely hard to succeed. And it's not easy to be a woman. I tell you, conservative woman is even harder, which makes us stronger. We have a lot of good, strong women. And I think we need to really cherish and support that, not to try to really attack with, you know, with really politicizing and bad legislation that, you know, the other side is trying to do. So I think it's truly protection of women's rights. And if you stand for women and women's rights, you should be in strong support of this bill. And I urge my colleagues to support it. And I strongly support this bill. And I thank Thank you, my colleagues, for bringing it to this committee. And I think this is an issue that's very important because we're the country of equal rights, 
and equal opportunities. And I think, you know, a lot of times we forget about that. And I think women bring so much to the table. And I would like to have more women be involved. And I want women to be able to succeed in sports because it brings a lot of opportunities for them that otherwise they will not have. And, you know, and these girls are working hard. And, and I, I thank everyone who will be supporting this bill. And we should really be watching who really standing for women or just does talking points and political appeasement on paper. Do you really stand for women and women's rights or not? And uh, I thank you very much. And I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The, uh, the gentlelady from, I, I think, uh, I just want to get the right order because I don't know if you can, do you have an amendment or do you? I have an amendment. Okay, oh. and we'll go with, we'll go with the gentlelady from uh, Pennsylvania. And then we'll go to Mr. Ivey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 718. Gentleman from California reserves a point of order without uh, the, the, Amendment will be considered without objection. Amendment will be considered as read. Uh, the uh, chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Pennsylvania to explain her amendment. You want me to go before yeah. it's distributed? That's thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment. Your, your your ability to explain is so good. We didn't even need it any further. Thank you. I, and you know what? It is a simple, clean <laughs> amendment. It is going to be very clear. Uh, my amendment would add to H.R. 7187 the so-called Protection of Women in Olympic and Amateur Sports Act. The it would add the obligation that sports organizations are required, uh, require employees to report sexual abuse of athletes. Let me say that again. Uh, an obligation that sports organizations require employees to report sexual abuse of athletes. I cannot agree with my Republican colleagues that, as written, H.R. 7187 would help women and girls. There are many problems and inequities that face women and girls in locker rooms and on the sporting field, but the inclusion of trans athletes in women's sports is simply not one of them. I want to call back, if you remember, Utah uh, Governor Spencer Cox, a Republican, explained his thoughtful decision to veto HB 11 it was a state bill, like H.R. 7187, that would have banned transgender girls from participating in women's sports. Allow me to read his letter, his thoughtful, thoughtful letter, I commend it to all of you, uh, about his cho uh, choice to veto. He writes in part, again, this is uh, March 22nd of 2022, uh, by a Republican Governor Spencer Cox. Transgender sports participation issue is one of the most decisive of our time, but I hope you will permit me an opportunity to explain my reasons for vetoing HB 11. And he moves on very thoughtfully. Finally, there is one more reason for this veto. I must admit I'm not an expert on transgenderism. I struggle to understand so much of it, and the science is conflicting. When in doubt, however, I always try to err on the side of kindness mercy, and compassion. I also try to get proximate, and I am learning so much from our transgender community. They are great kids who face enormous struggles. Here are the numbers that have most impacted my decision. 75,000, four, one, 86, 56. 75,000 high school kids participating in high school sports in Utah. Four transgender kids playing in high school sports in Utah. One transgender student playing girls sports. 86% of trans youth report suicidality. 56% of trans youth having attempted suicide. Four kids and only one of them playing girls' sports across his entire state. That's what this is all about. Four kids who aren't dominating or winning trophies or taking scholarships. Four kids who are just trying to find some friends and feel like they are a part of something. Four kids just trying to get through each day. Rarely has so much fear and anger been directed at so few. Please, members on the other side of this aisle, read this thoughtful letter from your Republican colleague who says that we should err on the side of mercy and compassion 
and allowing children to have their lives as difficult as it is to get through adolescence in a state of being happy in themselves, participating with their friends in sports. Why would you deny that? What are you afraid of? Honest to God, what are you afraid of? I don't understand it. These young people desperately need to be included, to be welcomed. You send the exact opposite message every single time you can. And I have to admit to you, consider the paradox of what we just considered, a bill to protect children from exploitation, grotesque exploitation, and yet we follow it up with a bullying bill. Shame on this markup. We should not turn a blind eye to the genuine problems facing women and girls who we know are disproportionately vulnerable to sexual abuse. UNESCO reports that roughly one in five women and girls around the world have suffered sexual abuse in sporting events and in the sporting environment. These horrific accounts must not go unreported. I urge my colleagues who are serious about protecting women and girls, not merely bullying trans children, to support my amendment. I urge my colleagues to err on the side of kindness, mercy, and compassion. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair Mr. recognizes Mr. ranking Chairman, member. I withdraw the point of order, but I would note that the, the, the amendment on, the gentlelady on. described is not the one before us. Yeah, and that's what we're going to the ranking member. The gentleman withdraws the point of order. Mr. Gentleman. Chairman, the uh, wrong amendment by Ms. Dean was uh, distributed, so I ask that uh, that amendment be withdrawn <laughs> and the proper amendment distributed. Without objection. And, uh, <laughs> and, and the next time Ms. Dean offers an amendment, we will wait for it to be distributed. <laughs> okay, re reserve a point of order. I think she explained it, but we'll, we'll make sure everyone gets a copy of the, the amendment. Ms. Ms. Dean has two amendments. I assume she's going to offer them both. Uh, but we'll get the one distributed, and then we'll proceed with debate.
Gentlelady. Gentleman from Arizona withdraws his point of order. The gentlelady from uh, Wyoming is recognized. <clears throat> it is my understanding that this reporting requirement is already required, so I believe that this is redundant. Um, but there's just a few points. I'm not opposed to this amendment um, because it, we already have a requirement of reporting sexual abuse per perpetrated against any athlete to the appropriate local, state, or federal authorities. But there's a couple of points that I would make in, in response to the statements made by the, but by the proponent of this amendment. When you talk about sexual abuse against women, one of the things that we have repeatedly heard about is women athletes being forced to undress in front of men who are in their locker room. We have heard about um, the, it, and I, I, this, this mantra of please be kind and compassionate. I don't understand what is kind or compassionate about forcing female athletes to share locker room with locker rooms with male athletes. I don't understand why we are talking about the sexual abuse of women and then immediately turning and pivoting to the idea that that's happening against men. It is happening against women. We're all opposed to the sexual abuse of women. But one of the things that is being reported with men participating in female athletes is the sexual abuse aspect of this. I do not believe that it is kind or compassionate to erase biological women and girls and <coughs> pretend that they are the same thing as a man who claims to be a girl. I do not believe that that is kind or compassionate. I do not believe that it is kind or compassionate to allow men and boys to dominate women's athletics. I do not believe that it is kind or compassionate to deny a girl a college scholarship because a boy was faster and stronger. I do not believe that if you read the bill that is at issue here, all we have done is to not define female and male and simply state that we, this bill, that would, it would prohibit a person whose sex is male from participating in an amateur athletic competition that is designated for females, women, and girls. That is the only thing that this bill does. This is not a bill about transgenderism. This is not a bill that attacks the transgender community. It is about protecting women and girls in women and girls athletics. That is all. There are biological differences between girls and boys, regardless of what someone may claim that they are. All this bill does is make sure that we are being kind and compassionate to our female athletes. But if you believe that there is a need to include this amendment, I'm not opposed to it, but we need to stop attacking us, stop attacking Republicans, simply because we're trying to protect women and girls. We are very sincere in our belief that it is critically important that women and girls have, are able to access and participate in athletics. We believe that it is incredibly important that 13-year-old girls are able to play volleyball and basketball without the risk of being injured by a man or a boy. We are entirely sincere in protecting our families of girls and women who do not believe that their girls and women should have to compete against boys and men. With that, I yield back. General Lay yields back to chairman. I just want to confirm that the amendment is accepted. Yeah, I got to call the oh, question, which I'm here. I, I think we should adopt the amendment yeah. too. I, I think that I think that's generally understood. All those in uh, all those in move to strike the last word. Oh, gentleman from California is recognized. I guess it's a good thing that some folks on the other side are now interested in what happens in a locker room, and we're not going to look the other way. Okay, I'll accept that. But this is something that is not a thing. It's not a thing. We have things happening in our community that are a thing. 
kids getting mowed down by assault rifles at their school. That's a thing. Young women in their community having IVF treatments banned. That's a thing. Women being forced into government-mandated pregnancies. That's a thing. And those are all things that we can address in this committee. But OK, I'll, I'll play out this exercise with you all. How are you going to enforce this? I know I'm, I'm yielding to somebody over there. Tell me, how are you going to enforce this? This is an on-demand gender check that you want to be a part of now. So who, who's enforcing it? Is Mr. Jordan enforcing it? Is Mr. Gates enforcing it? Mr. Biggs? Who is enforcing this on-demand gender check? You didn't put that into the bill. Seems a little creepy that we don't know who's going to be determining genders here. Ms. Hageman, I'm deferring to you. You're the only one that wants to speak on this. It's interesting, you're the only one who wants to speak on this. No one else will even touch this, because it's kind of creepy. Kind of creepy that you're setting up on-demand gender checks. Uh, kind of obvious. Order, are you calling me creepy? I'm saying it's creepy that you're setting up an on-demand gender check and you won't tell us how you're going to enforce it. May I it. respond to that? Will you engage in it colloquially? Tell me how you're going to enforce it, yes. Well, according to the U.S. boxing transgender policy, they're the ones that plan on doing the, 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 the uh, inspection. The athlete has declared that her gender identity is female and has completed gender reassignment surgery. So, so not how do they protecting inspect it? girls and women how do they inspect protects it? us. That, I guess you're going to have to Should, ask the Boxing Association. Shouldn't you know? This they're, is your they're bill. the ones that have adopted the policy. I, I reclaim my time. They, they don't know. They don't know. They, they, they see a small issue that's happening in a few communities, and they want to extrapolate that across America. And they want you to think it's a thing. It's not a thing. There are things. Gun violence, fertility bans, government-mandated pregnancies. Those are things. This is not a thing. Ms. Jackson Lee, who has a bill to address the targeted violence against the transgender community, that's a thing. That's something we should be working on. This is not a thing, and so I just invite my Democratic colleagues who have so passionately spoke on this to continue to passionately speak on this, but to just reject this as a thing. And thank you for caring about what happens in locker rooms. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Yep. The gentlelady from Indiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Truly, I actually would like to play some video to say how we're going to enforce it. I want to see what it really can cause, how much harm, and we can show examples to have a much stronger guy playing the sports against biologically not as strong women. Most of us, and I, as, as I said, are not biologically as strong. And it is unfortunate that the other side tried to, you know, de really deter the conversation in a different d direction and divert it to, you know, and, and not talking about, let's talk about how we are going to protect our women and girls. And I would appreciate if we can have video of some examples how our girls can actually got hurt. not to be enforcing but preventing the situation like that where girls actually get hurt by males, biological males playing sports. I mean, it is really unbelievable for me that this is an issue that we cannot stand with women and girls on because it is so hard. I, as I said, you know, it makes us much tougher, you know, maybe mentally, and a lot of us are before that reason. But let's just be honest. 
boys, you know, natural biological boys have, more, you know, have advantage, have a differently advantage against women playing sports. Let's recognize and be honest about that and not divert the conversation. So I would really appreciate us to go back to this bill and not to try to talk about issues like some of the other side are trying to do, that we can debate and deliberate. But and we will debate yield? and deliberate. You know, but, but this issue protected women. Yes, I will yield. Yeah. Can you ask the proponent of the bill how that solves what you are speaking of in a global sense as opposed to dealing with the cases as they come. What could not understand any of the film that you saw? There was no names or no designation. I saw humanity, I saw girls enjoying sports, but I couldn't understand what it was. The, the, the opponent of the bill needs to say how this bill fixes anything that you've just spoken about. Well, this is, this is where you saw the examples Thank where you for transgender boys, you know, transgender girls in this case, they're playing you know, transgender athletes were playing against naturally born girls in this on the same you know teams on opposing teams, and girls got girls got hurt. That was an example like that. If we going to say that we are not going to have this situation, so we will not have you know the disadvantage that you have as a female playing against much stronger athlete. The you know will that. Not answer the question. How does that help what you're saying? And we couldn't make any sense out of the film. Listen. Well, happen? I will. I will. I will. It's a slippery well, slope what we're doing. But I will deal with Ms. So, Hagman. So, all of those were videos that I'm. I'm actually very surprised that my colleague on the other side isn't fully aware of those particular videos. They've been showed over and over and over again in a variety of media. And I, I guess that if you have not seen those videos and are not aware of the circumstances where females have been injured by males in volleyball games, field hockey games, and those sorts of things, I guess that, that I'm surprised that you're saying that this is something that really isn't happening when you're now telling us that you're completely unaware of the incidents where in fact it has happened. And what this bill does, the way that this bill resolves that, is that that male volleyball player wouldn't have been on that court to hurt the female. That male would not have been in that basketball game to hurt the female. That male would not have been in the field hockey to hurt the female had this bill been in place. Well, I'm That's aware that we want to protect Please young let me finish. Athletes. I have not yielded to you. Well, I understand it's her so time. What time I'm belongs saying to the gentlelady from Indiana, from Indiana who's from yielded Indiana. to the gentlelady from Wyoming. What I am saying is that this bill, by stating that it prohibits a person whose sex is male from participating in an amateur athletic competition that is designated for time. females, women, and girls, those incidents wouldn't. Those incidents wouldn't have happened. The time. The time has expired, I, Mr. Chairman. What Mr. I'd Mr. like to do is adopt the amendment, and then we can keep the debate going. I mean, I think the debate is largely on the legislation. If the committee is comfortable with that, all those in favor Mr. of the amendment Mr. offered Mr. by the gentlelady from. I wanted to strike the last word. You want to go on the amendment? Yes. Okay. Then the gentlelady from California is recognized to speak on the amendment that's got unanimous support. Correct, and I want to yield to my colleague from Texas, Ms. Okay. Jackson Lee. Very, very that's kind. Fine. That's fine. Uh, I'm not sure of the unanimous support of the amendment, but I do want to clarify that uh, members on this side of the aisle, not speaking for each and every one of them, uh, clearly have as one of their uh, operatives is to protect our children, to protect uh, whether they are athletes or not athletes. Uh, the footage that was shown was enormously unclear. There was no. Uh, language, there was no um, uh, voice over, there was no print, etc. So let's move on from saying that we have no knowledge or no interest in protecting athletes. What I, my question is, and it, it is still on the table, how 7187 in any way uh, points to a solution uh, to that those acts if those acts occurred. Again, the film does not evidence that, but the point I want to make is that the proponent of the legislation has not answered the question of humanity, has not answered the question of uh, whether or not the, the, the cost of discrimination is a higher cost to pay by this legislation than the problem that it's looking to solve. We've already heard from uh, the gentlelady from Washington about what it may do uh, to, to her daughter, a, an example of the trans community. I've already offered an amendment that evidences statistically the, the murders of trans women who happen to be African-Americans 
does that legislation that we're dealing with uh, athletics deal with the larger question? Um, and there is no answer to that. And so if there is a question of male, female strength, again, she has no answer to that because Mr. Swanwell had a question, what is the mechanism of enforcement? Never has that been answered. What is the mechanism of enforcement? Uh, all you have, you're gonna have condemnation. In cities, counties, hamlets, states across America, condemnation, interrogation, intimidation. That is what you're going to get. And you have no answer why this legislation should even be on the roster in the Judiciary Committee for us even to move forward. I've said this over and over again. So with that in mind, uh, I, we have yielded. We, we will not, I assume you can get your own time. We have yielded for you to answer. None of those answers have been forthcoming. There's will no you enforcement yield? mechanism at all. Will you yield? Um, it is the general ladies from California's time. Thank you. Um, it would be up to the USOC in terms of compliance, but de determining bio biological sex can be done with a cheek swab. It doesn't require a physical examination, as has so emotionally been described on the other side today. The other thing that I guess that I'm so terribly confused about is I don't think most people are confused about what is a boy and what is a girl or what is a man and what is a woman. I don't think that this is some kind of a mystery that we're incapable the of figuring out. The gentle lady yield to me. No, I will not. No, it's, it's my time, and I reclaim office. my time and yield to the gentle lady. So you don't want my answers. Yeah. Thank you. I, I just want to say, first of all, please stop talking about how an emotional response from the other side is not appropriate. Mm. We are all human beings in this committee, Thank you. and it is appropriate for us to have emotional responses about our children and a whole community of children that is listening to this and hurt by it. Mm. Secondly, I want to say to the sponsor of this bill, let's just take as given that you actually care about the rights of women and girls in sports. Let's just, I'm just going to give that to you and say, all right, maybe that's true. Maybe that's true. Wouldn't you want to listen to what the Women's Sports Foundation says, what the National Women's Law Center says, what the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee says, what the International Olympic Committee says. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record this letter from the Women's Sports Foundation and the National uh, Women's Law Center. The objection. Let me just be clear, contrary to its title, this bill does not protect girls and women's sports. Instead, it is a misguided and harmful measure that amounts to no more than a discriminatory attempt to target and exclude an already marginalized group of girls and women who are transgender, rather than addressing equity issues that girls and women face in sports. It goes on to say, that the policies that ban girls and women who are transgender actually perpetuate harmful and dangerous stereotypes to, that lead to the policing and harassment of cisgender girls and women. Do you know what cisgender girls and women are? That is what you define as girls and women. And it is saying here, right here in this letter, that it is harmful. What you are doing is harmful to those girls and women that you claim to want to protect. Now, in addition, principle four my, of the Olympic Charter. My time has Charter, expired, so I need to reclaim it and yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Generally Anybody, yields, generally yields if back. If wants to claim time, I would love a little more. I, uh, we Mr. understand. Chairman. I'm sure we'll get it. But I, I would like to deal with the amendment, and then we're going to continue the debate. So uh, the, the question occurs on the amendment from the gentlelady from Mr. Pennsylvania. Mr. Chairman. We just adopt the amendment, and then we'll go right. We'll come right back into the debate. It's not going to. Well, what I, I want to respond to something that she said on the amendment. So, if I can just finish my point, I would really appreciate well, it. Uh, well, we'll recognize the ranking member to yield. I will yield to the gentlelady from Washington. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. <laughs> Additionally, Principle Four of the Olympic Charter outlines that the practice of sport is a human right. Okay. Every individual must have access to the practice of sport. Okay. And by imposing a categorical ban on women and girls who are transgender, this directly conflicts with the International Olympic Committee's framework on fairness, inclusion, and non-discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sex variations. And it goes on to say that actually, under the Ted Stevens Olympic and Amateur Sports Act of 1978, the US Olympic Committee is prohibited from discriminating on the basis of race, color, religion, age, sex, disability, or national origin regarding. Deca for decades, federal courts that have interpreted these non-discrimination laws have overwhelmingly recognized that anti-trans discrimination relies on sex stereotypes 
and is a form of sex discrimination. So when the gentlelady who, who's, who's the sponsor of this bill tries to say that this is actually something that is, is supportive of women and girls and all of a sudden the other side has decided they want to be supportive of women and girls, I would ask you to look at what the organizations that actually represent women and girls in sports say. They do not say that this is helpful at all. And my colleague, Mr. Swalwell from California, is absolutely right. Will you yield? That, uh, not right now, because I am, I, I am in the middle, it's Mr. Nadler's time, but I am in the middle of making a very important point, which is not only is Mr. Swalwell right, and I tried to make these arguments earlier, this is a tiny, tiny, tiny group of people that you are trying to criminalize, essentially, make feel like they don't belong in our country. Not only is that true, it's not a thing, but on top of that, even if, even if we were to take at face value that you care about women and girls, and I, listen, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to do that in my emotional state as a mother of a trans daughter. I'm willing to give you the, the right to say, all right, I care about this. Even then, why don't you listen to the National Sports Foundation that deals with sports for women and girls and what is good inclusive policy? That is what we should be doing here. And please stop talking about my emotional response to your bill. Yeah, it's emotional because you know what? There are Republican, independent, and Democratic parents out there of trans kids. I know because I did a roundtable, a bipartisan roundtable, with our former colleague, Ileana ross Leighton about this issue. People don't want this ridiculousness and it is deeply hurtful and harmful to our kids. Now, maybe you don't have a trans kid. Maybe nobody on this committee has a trans kid. I don't know. I think I'm the only one. But why don't you start to think about what this feels like to kids and parents across the country when you use the kind of language that you do that is not even based in any kind of science? And so when you argue so righteously that you actually care about women and girls, why don't you start to look at what would actually make a difference for women and girls? Like more money so that we could make sure that women and girls programs are really thriving, like equal pay for athletes so that they can pursue their careers. Those are the things that make a difference. Reclaiming. This does not, I yield back to the- Reclaiming my time, I just want to point out the bill, I, I agree with everything the general lady said obviously, but. The bill, the gentle lady keeps talking about males competing against females. The bill defines a male as, male means an individual who, who has, had, will have, or would have, but for developmental or genetic anomaly, historical accident, the reproductive system that at some point produces, transports, and fertilizes sperm for fertilization. Would have, does not have, but would have, but for a developmental or genetic anomaly. In other words, the fact is that there are people, a tiny number of people, we call them transgender, who are not males, who may have an X and a Y chromosome, but are not males. They're a different category, they're transgender. And this bill, by seeking to characterize them as males and say that they somehow unfairly compete with females, discriminates against them. And we heard about the tiny number, the governor of Utah said there were four Four transgender people in uh, in sports, or and, and one you know on a women's team. Why are we seeking to humiliate and prohibit from participation in sports this tiny number of people who are not in fact males? We have to realize that humanity is not, as we thought for a long time, divided into only two sexes. There are more than two, tiny numbers, but more than two. I yield back. Gentlemen, uh, yields back without objection. A statement from the sponsor of the legislation will be included in the record. Uh, the question occurs on the amendment from the gentlelady from Pennsylvania. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. Opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. I assume Ms. Dean wants her second amendment. Uh, yeah, I think it is Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon is recognized. Thank you, I do have an amendment at the desk. Uh, the clerk will report. 
Gentleman from Florida reserves a point of order. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of Without a Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized to uh, explain her amendment. Okay, thank you. I want to be clear here. This bill, H.R. 7187, is not about supporting and protecting women or females, as the bill would define them. As several of my colleagues have pointed out, the rationale for this bill and many of the comments we've heard from the other side of the aisle elevates cynical and dangerous political attacks on the transgender community. Everyone deserves the opportunity to play sports, to be part of a team, to have fun, and to learn resilience while challenging themselves. House Republicans have already voted to keep trans girls and women off their school sports teams. Now they want to jam through a bill to prevent trans girls and women of all ages and all levels from participating in sports. The fact is that there are real issues facing female athletes, but as usual, our Republican colleagues are missing the mark. Where's the discussion of legitimate barriers like lack of resources, vulnerability to abuse, bias, and wage gaps? I find it outrageous that this majority is yet again using the House Judiciary Committee to fearmonger and bully members of the trans community, a, com a group of already marginalized citizens who just want to fit in and be included. When I was growing up, Title IX was in its infancy, but we knew the purpose of that law was to make everyone welcome and included in sports, an experience that has taught every member of my family valuable lessons that we still use today. Whether in school or elsewhere, we should not retreat from policies that promote the inclusion of all Americans, whether in athletics, employment, academics, housing, or all aspects of our civic life. I understand that the proponents of this bill say that they want to protect women and girls, but as multiple members have pointed out, this bill does so at the cost of marginalizing and harming individuals in our transgender community. That's what this bill is about, exclusion and fear mongering. Meanwhile, the policies that American people and American women in particular actually want continue to be ignored or attacked. Now, this bill, as written, defines a female as an individual who has had or will have the reproductive system that at some point produces, transports, and utilizes eggs for fertilization. Very handmaiden kind of uh, definition there. This bill mimics bills that have been brought in several states, which have sought to narrowly define the terms male and female while ignoring science and facts regarding sex and gender particularly for the transgender population. Actual scientific research shows that it's more complicated than just male or female. Sex chromosomes can indicate one thing, anatomy can indicate something else, and other genetic factors can play a role. We know that our Republican colleagues aren't open to considering the rights and facts regarding our transgender citizens, and they've refused to withdraw this bill from the markup. So, since this bill purports to define women by their reproductive systems, I think it only makes sense that we do talk about reproductive health care here today. Because we can't talk about women's equality for female athletes or others in the workplace without talking about access to reproductive health care. That's why I'm offering an amendment to this bill to prohibit amateur sports organizations from discriminating against anyone for being pregnant or access, accessing reproductive health care, including abortion care, contraception, or IVF. And that would include not only athletes, but also the coaches, administrators, and staff of these organizations. Since the Dobbs decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, states across the country have moved to restrict access to reproductive health care in a variety of ways, including banning abortion care, IVF, and certain forms of contraception. The consequences have been devastating as providers have been forced to relocate and close their doors. And American women have found themselves in dangerous situations as they've struggled to find appropriate care. In the face of that reality, we need to make sure that the athletes and staff working at these organizations aren't discriminated against for accessing needed health care. If my Republican colleagues really wanted to support women, they'd support this amendment and ensure that female, female athletes and all women have the freedom to make their own personal health care decisions. I yield back. General Lady yields back to point of order with Sean. General Lady from Wyoming is recognized for five minutes. Again, this, this amendment has nothing to do 
with the bill that is before this body. Um, pro, uh, talking about abortion and contraception and reproductive health care services has nothing to do with protecting girls and women's sports and athletics. If you want to, draw, to, to, to come up with and, and, and introduce a bill directed to this, you're more than welcome to, but it has nothing to do with the debate we're having today. I also want to say I'm really tired of the other side personally attacking us and impugning our character and accusing us of all kinds of nefarious deeds simply because we do not adopt your radical gender ideology. It was only about five minutes ago that everyone in this room would have been able to define a woman and a man. It was only about five minutes ago that every woman in this room would have been horrified by the idea that Title IX would be used to allow men to compete against women in athletics. It was only about five minutes ago that we recognized that there are biological differences between men and women with very, very limited uh, uh, changes to that, uh, very limited exceptions. This amendment is absolutely unnecessary for the purpose of the bill, which is to protect women and girls in athletics. And in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the public sentiment on this, public sentiment is not on your side. The American people do not believe that boys and men should be competing against girls and women. The Washington Post survey from April 2023 66% of Americans do not think that biological males should be allowed to compete in women's sports competitions at the high school level, and 65% of Americans do not believe that biological males should compete in women's sports at the college or professional level. A Gallup poll released in June 2023 found that 69% of Americans believe that athletes should only be allowed to play on sports teams that match their biological sex which actually increased since 2021. Nobody is saying that someone who believes that they are transgender cannot compete in athletics. They simply have to compete in the, with, with the same biological sex of, of, of who they are. If someone is transgender and is capable of making it to the Olympics, they are free to compete in the Olympics. But if they are a man, they should compete in the men's category. And if they are women, they should compete in the women's category. This bill doesn't do anything other than that. It just simply states that men should not be competing against women. That's all it does. And as a woman, I take great offense to anybody who believes that I do not sincerely want to protect women and girls in athletics, in, in, the, in the safety of their own homes, in their jobs, in employment, and in every other category. This amendment is unnecessary, and I would urge my colleagues to vote against it. Gentlelady yields back. Gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Ivey, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to my colleague from Wyoming, I, I say I'm not um, questioning your sincerity. This, you know, we just may disagree on some things here. I, I did want to comment on a few things, though. I, you know, the video uh, that you showed, I, I don't know field hockey, but I do know basketball. And um, you showed a video of, a, I, I guess, a, someone getting hurt um, in the competition uh, on a rebound. I, I do want to point out to the gentlelady and to my, my colleagues that um, in women's basketball, uh, especially at the collegiate level. And the University of Maryland is in my district, by the way. Um, you know, go Terps, go Terps Final Four, uh, on multiple occasions, national champions. They use men in practice all the time. I mean, it's a fairly routine practice uh, for that to happen. And I think there are high school girls teams that do that too. Uh, one school that's also in my district, Bishop McNamara, a perennial top 10 in the nation, girls basketball teams. Um, in fact, they have... Uh, kids from that team that have gone that are playing in the WNBA, just like University of Maryland does too. 
So I don't think it's automatically dangerous that there's some sort of competition. I take your point that you're, you're trying to protect women, but I gotta say this, um, the women athletes in my, in my district at least aren't asking for your protection. In fact, I, I think generally speaking, they kind of resent it because they want to compete. If you look at someone like Caitlin Clark, it's a little ironic we're doing this debate on the eve of the, uh, the start of the women's uh, national tournament at the NCAA level. Um, they always recoil when, when they're sort of segregated off with respect to comparison. She didn't want to say that she's uh, only the highest scorer in the history of women's basketball. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, not at this point, but I, I'll come back to you in a minute but that she um, was the highest scorer of all time. She took great pleasure in, in beating out Pete Maravich for the score, national uh, scoring champion of all time. So from my perspective, and we've got a, I'm about a million people in my district, there's about 136,000 school kids. Many of them are playing um, sports at the high school level and the middle school level too. Uh, AAU competition uh, and college, as I mentioned. Um, I'm not aware of any transgender kids trying to compete in any of those sports. Uh, I reached out to my school system. They said they didn't know of any. So from my perspective, this is legislation in search of a problem. It's a problem that doesn't exist in my county. I haven't really seen it uh, at our state level in Maryland. I'm not seeing it in the NCAA tournament that starts um, you know, this week. Uh, and it's been going all year, and it's been a great year. By the way, if you, if you stop somebody on the street and say, who's named the top uh, college basketball player this year? I mean, I bet most of them have heard about Caitlin Clark, but would have trouble naming uh, a comparable male basketball player. And I think that's as it should be. By the way, too, we, we've got scenarios where we've got girls at the high school level or middle school level going out for the football team and making it. Uh, girls competing in wrestling, going out for the team and making it. I think that's fine. I think we should leave that so that they can do it. But then the last point I want to make, too, is just to reference back to um, the veto message that was delivered by the Republican governor of Utah, Spencer Cox, uh, in reaction to this, right before he vetoed similar kind of legislation uh, in his state. And he said something kind of similar. He's got 75,000 high school kids participating in high school sports, four transgender kids playing high school sports in Utah, one transgender student playing girl sports, 86% of, tra of trans youth reporting suicidality, 56% of trans youth having attempted suicide. So even if you care about women's sports and even if you're trying to protect women, uh, I'm not questioning your, your honesty or your, your position on that. But I do think we should also consider the kids on the other side of this, the kids who are seeing, the transgender kids who are seeing this, this debate, uh, and not just this one, but debates across the country at state level, um, on TV and, on, and the like. And to them, this is a message of rejection and exclusion. It's, it's hurtful to them. None of my, I've got six kids, none of them are transgender. Um, so I, I don't have any personal experience with this, but you know, I do hope that we can try and be more um, considerate of their concerns and their needs as well. Try and balance this out. Uh, you know, if you, you're worried about women's sports, I take it your word, although I think women's sports is doing better now in the United States than it ever has been. I think it will continue to be so. And with that, I yield back. Gentlemen's time's expired. Gentlelady from Indiana, Ms. Sparks is recognized for five minutes. I'm going to strike the last word. I actually wanted to, you know, uh, rebut a few points you mentioned. You know, because I actually, mother of two girls who play on the varsity team at high school, and they do practice with my husband playing golf, but it's very different when you practice or actually having a competitive game. And let's just be honest, you say people, you know, you know, there is, you know, no, no uh, organizations that, you know, like organizations that supporting this. I'll be honest with you, I've been in the legislative branch for some time here in the state Senate before, and I will tell you that most of the organizations have a pretty names, and they have a lot of presentations, but a lot of them don't even stand for the people on the ground with these issues. So I actually would take any endorsements of any 
pretty sounded organization with a grain of salt. I've seen that people that sit on the national farm boards never been on the combine and promote actually some of these policies that are bad for real farmers, small farmers on the ground, not for large monopolies they try to protect. So there are a lot of them, there is the money and, and power protected in DC. So I usually have a very, I see who fund the organization, what they're about. But you know, you're talking about girl and women. This is just a common sense and science. You know, biological sex does matter. That matter, I wish it wouldn't. I would be really mean and tough, but I already am without it. As I said, you know, with Second Amendment rights, I'm good with it, okay? But I'll tell you that this is really, you know, disappointing for me that we worry about, and no one is trying to hurt anyone here, but why are we not worrying about hurting opportunities and really discriminating against girls and women? Why we are not worrying about this in this debate? Here's just protecting, you know, biological girls and women and not hurting their opportunities. They work extremely hard. And I'm telling you how well, hard this, a lot of these girls work. Well, the, the opportunities for you. college, the opportunities for advancement, job to win. And I think we should be really honest about that. Well, well the gentlelady. Yeah, you? I will yield it to you, sure. Okay. I, I mean, I'm, I'll stick with basketball because Prince George's County, I'm tracked for that matter, too turn out Olympians that would match any other jurisdiction here. Our high school teams are turning out women going to play basketball at the college level across the country, AAU national champions and the like. They're not asking for this. They're doing just fine with the track that they're on. They're getting college scholarships. They're playing in the WNBA. They're not asking for this help because I don't think they feel that they need well, it. Well, we, we may have different people in your district, in my district, because I have a lot of people in my district that we're upset. A lot of women and school-age girls are upset. They're put in this situation. So I think we need to have an honest conversation about why we would not give girls these opportunities to protect for them, opportunities to compete. Because ultimately, we have to be honest. That is science. If we go back to science, and that is a common sense that we're born biologically different, and that's just a reality. We can spin this reality, we can have a lot of definitions. I can't even keep up with all of these definitions. Well, well, but this is you? a reality that we have. You know, we are different when we are born with different physical capabilities, not all, but we have inherent, you know, genetical, you know, formula when we're born. That is genetics. That is, you cannot well, change that well, well, in, in as you. much as we want to do that. And I think that's why, yeah, I will yield to you. Sure. Name one transgender player who's been drafted by the WNBA. Well, listen, it's not about, you know, who's been drafted or not drafted, okay? Those we have a situation, what I'm just talking about. to you, we have a situation where we need to really be very clear. Do we want to have biological male play in women's sport? That is goes to this. Do we want to have them allowed to happen or not? Or we should maybe resolve, there are some, I'm sure there are some kids with a lot of mental health issues. And really, there are a lot of issues driven by a lot of different things. There are a lot of, but what, well, what well, here, the, the question at us, do we believe that my logical male should be played on girls' teams or well, women's well, teams. Well, the gentlelady yield. No, please, could you answer? Like, I will yield to you, but do you believe I, that I my logical male should be played? I don't know that? of any who were trying to do. The question I was going to ask you was: yes. at the NCAA level, women's basketball, are there transgender players trying to compete in that league? I, I mean, I just there may be, but I just haven't heard about it. And as far as I can tell, they're none in the tournament. Well, we have in other ones, right? We have a swimming team and other ones, but it will be, right? That's so the, the question is, of. the question is, do we want to allow that or not? So because it will be more. So if we do not put this legislation, there will be more in a lot of no. different things. But do you believe we put girls at disadvantage? I, I'm just saying this legislation is not needed. I, my high school well, classmate won the gold medal and the 100 meter hurdles in the 1984 Olympics. But we'd have to define Nobody's the trying here. to compete that I know of, you know, well, but I, I know one be. swimmer, but other than that. It I will know. be, and that's why we need to be clear. My time, my time is expired. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado. Uh, I thank the chair, and I'd like to yield uh, my time to the gentlewoman from Pennsylvania. General Lady Director. Thank you. I understand that this bill's proponent has offered it with the intent to protect women and girls who play sports. And I would argue that my amendment shares that purpose because it addresses an issue that women athletes are actually advocating for. 
This bill explicitly defines females mm -hmm. in terms of their reproductive capacity, their ability to produce eggs and bring them to uh, term. But in the wake of the Dobbs decision, female athletes across multiple sports have expressed concerns about restrictions on their freedom to access birth control, fertility treatments, abortion, and other reproductive health care. So this amendment would ensure that when you're going to define women and men in sports on the basis of their reproductive capacity, that those people would have the freedom to access um, health care related to their reproductive capacity. And I would just request unanimous consent to enter into the record uh, an article entitled Women in Sport, Female Athletes Have Made Strides on Reproductive Freedom in the Workplace from NorthJersey.com, July 1st, 2022. Objection. Thank you. Does the gentlelady yield, does the gentleman yield back? Gentleman yield, the gentlelady yields to the gentleman from Colorado. The gentleman from Colorado yields back. The gentleman from Colorado yields back. I, I didn't want to assume anything there, Mr. Just Goose. Happy to confirm. Yeah. Uh, I think the question, no, the gentleman from uh, Oregon is recognized, Mr. Betts. Uh, I yield uh, to the gentlelady from uh, Wyoming. Uh, just very quickly, but Mr. But, but Mr. Ivey had left. The only question that I had for him about Caitlin Clark, as he's uh, describing her athletic powers, which I've, I've seen her and, and she's quite the athlete. But the question is, if they don't care about whether men and women are on the same team, why doesn't she just play on the man's team? And if she did, would she be nearly as successful? With that, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back to the gentleman from Oregon. The gentleman from Oregon yields back. The gentleman from California is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I also want to express my appreciation for our colleague from Wyoming for bringing this bill up, this legislation. It's a good place to debate this issue. We've had this debate in California for a number of years. And the central question is really, do you need this legislation? You talk about it. You have to think about it. Before you vote, you've got to really ponder. But I, I think you've got to ponder the facts. And I've got to tell you, back home just this last year, uh, here in Congress, I honored a young lady who was a starting pitcher, the boys' baseball team, championship baseball team. They won. She competed with the men. Another high school in my district, the wrestling team. When my son was wrestling a dozen years ago, and women were wrestling with him on the men's or the boys' wrestling team. My son came home and said, Dad, you're not gonna believe what I'm about to tell you. This young lady on my team has my respect. She pinned a couple of my, my friends on the mat. So when you talk about the need for this legislation, when you talk about protecting, I'm trying to figure out who needs protection, boys or the girls. And, and this Would is the really gentleman a question. Yield? Of course, go ahead. Are you advocating for the abolishment of Title IX? I'm not advocating for the abolishment of Title IX. It sounds like you're, you may be saying that there's no reason to have girls and boys athletics at all. Is that what you're advocating? No, ma'am. My colleague from Wyoming, what I'm advocating for is giving them the opportunity. If they want to choose another place to compete, they can compete in that area. You're looking at protection, and I'm looking at opportunity. Thank you very much. Well, hold on a second. I yield for my colleague from Colorado. I thank the gentleman uh, for uh, yielding the time and, and for his eloquence. Uh, I would just simply say, and I know that this has been a, a very robust debate with respect to this particular bill, there are a lot of incredibly important priorities that the American people care deeply about that warrant the consideration of this committee. In 24 hours, in my community will mark the three-year anniversary of a devastating mass shooting that happened at a local grocery store in Boulder, Colorado. Ten people died, including one police officer who tragically died in the line of duty, sacrificing, making the ultimate sacrifice and saving lives. This committee has jurisdiction, as we know, over law enforcement agencies and over federal statute, statutes that govern the provisioning and, and uh, the regulation of weapons and firearms. We've yet to consider a single bill 
one in the 118th Congress to address gun violence in our communities, in our schools, in our movie theaters, in our grocery stores. And just once, I'd like to attend a markup in the House Judiciary Committee and be able to go back and tell my constituents that we addressed that challenge, among many other challenges. We've got a long list. So I recognize, obviously, we're going to have a vote on this bill, and we'll move on to the next one. I just would offer, I suppose, to the chairman and to the committee staff uh, our, uh, our, our request, uh, our effort to implore all of you to consider some common sense legislation that I think the American people very much would like to see us debate. And with that, uh, I yield back to the gentleman from California. Yeah. When yields back, the question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from Pennsylvania. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no, no. Aye. Opinion of the chairs, uh, the no's have it. Gentlelady from California requests to record a vote. The clerk will uh, call the roll. Mr. Jordan. No. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Issa. It's this one. Right? Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Massey. Mr. Roy. Mr. Bishop. Ms. Sparts. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Benz. Mr. Benz votes no. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong votes no. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Gooden votes no. Mr. Van Drew. Mr. Nels. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley. Ms. Hageman. No. Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran. Mr. Moran votes no. Ms. Lee. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Fry. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee. Mr. Cohen, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Schiff, Mr. Swalwell, Mr. Swalwell votes aye. Mr. Liu, aye. Mr. Liu votes aye. Ms. Jayapal, aye. Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Mr. Correa, aye. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Nagus, Mr. Nagus votes aye. Ms. McBath, aye. Ms. McBath votes aye. Ms. Dean. Ms. Escobar, Ms. Ross, aye. Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush, Mr. Ivy, aye. Mr. Ivy votes aye. Ms. Ballant, aye. Mr. Van Drew, you are not recorded. No. Mr. Van Drew votes no. Ms. Sparts, you are not recorded. Ms. Sparts votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee. Ms. Jackson Lee, you're not recorded. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Gentleman from Florida. Mr. Gates, you are not recorded. Mr. Gates votes no. Ms. Escobar, you're not recorded. Ms. Escobar votes aye. We okay?
Wisconsin. Mr. Tiffany, you're not recorded. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 13 ayes and 14 noes. Uh, the amendment is not adopted. Who seeks recognition? Question occurs. You got an amendment, Sheila? No problem. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Clerk will report. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman from Florida reserves a point of order. The clerk will pass the, the, clerk will pass the amendment out, and then we'll, the gentleman lady is recognized to explain her amendment. Lady, may I proceed? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As I indicated, um, I have uh, you may hit the mic there. Yeah. Uh, with the underlying legislation, um, and it is clear that I oppose it. I've made a point of the necessity of um, our work being to uplift humanity, uh, and however you wish to interpret the underlying legislation, it poses a great difficulty for an isolated or a, a unique uh, group of Americans. So I oppose this legislation. Uh, because of its blanket ban, will harm all women and girls in addition to transgender women and girls. If an NGB is required to ban all transgender athletes from competition designated for women and girls, the question arises, how will they enforce the ban? We have throughout this uh, markup asked that question and have yet to be answered. Uh, this legislation then would likely lead to invasive screening procedures to verify an athlete's gender across the sports world that would potentially create uh, opportunities right for abusers. And to suggest that, that a DNA, we, we know what uh, DNA uh, has been used for. We have a historical record uh, from slavery uh, into uh, the 20th century uh, in terms of uh, the actions of the Germans uh, dealing with the Holocaust. We know what this leads to. This bill's blanket ban would still invite scrutiny and harassment of any other person perceived by anyone as not conforming to sex stereotypes. Um, and so these hostile and discriminatory stereotypes are often directed at women of color who would likely receive disproportionate sc scrutiny if this dreadful bill ever became law. According to a letter opposing H.R. 7187 signed by dozens of civil rights groups in states with bans on transgender athletes, there are already reports of cisgender girls being accused of lying about their gender and subsequently being subject to harassment and threats simply because they don't meet some people's interpretation or expectations of femininity. While the purpose of this bill is fundamentally wrong, this amendment would at least improve it by effectively prohibiting an NGB from instituting a blanket ban on transgender participation. I want my colleagues to know this goes against my very grain because I have indicated that this legislation should not be before us, um, but I have yielded uh, in a, a last ditch effort uh, to be able to uh, make, uh, give some light uh, to a very tragic initiative uh, that is going to be detrimental uh, to this nation. And so I ask my colleagues uh, to support uh, which uh, may be an enhancement uh, of um, the underlying legislation, uh, of banning all categories so that every person is treated with dignity. Gentlelady yields back. The gentlelady from Wyoming is recognized. This obviously fundamentally changes the very purpose of the bill, and I recommend a no vote, and I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. 
gentleman withdraws his point of order. The question, the gentleman from New Jersey is recognized. Look, I, uh, first of all, Chairman, I want to apologize that I haven't been here the whole time. We had a ceremony, congressional gold medal oh. for World War II veterans. Congratulations. Uh, three of them left alive. One of them happens to live 20 minutes from me That's awesome. in my district. And uh, you want to know what America's about. God, when you sit there and listen to what they did, you do. You know, I, I also, I think I have a sense of what America's about. And uh, I'm a dentist. But you don't have to spend years of study in medical school or dental school. And I'm sorry, but I'm going to say it. There's an undeniable physical difference between men and women. There just is, anatomically. I'm not mentally, I don't know what people think. I have a rule of thumb for myself and what I believe is, should be true. I don't care what people do in their bedroom, but I don't want it forced on my kids, and I don't want to have to pay for it. This country and the left have consorted reality to a great degree so much that a bill like this is actually necessary. Think about it. Think how hard so many of us fought that so my daughter and my granddaughter have a right to compete, Title IX. We, we know all this already. And to take individuals who anatomically, regardless of how they feel spiritually, mentally, whatever other way, and I can't speak to that, anatomically still have a different muscle, muscular structure, have a different bone structure, are just different. They're not women. They're not biological women. And to make our young women who need to have this opportunity to compete against them is just wrong. Women spend decades fighting for equal rights in this country. And to be thinking that we're going to take it away because some men believe they're actually women, and I'm not going to criticize them, and I'm not going to say anything uh, about them, the but it is just wrong. And we're preventing, again, women of having the opportunity they deserve. And I know you've heard this all already, but I had to get on the record for it and say what I believe. Okay. So you've you got to protect women's rights to see them lose high school state comp competitions and championships to biological males is wrong. We've seen women lose college national championships, and it has happened. And we've seen women lose professional titles in sports like golf to biological males, and it is wrong. Enough is enough. Sometimes common sense is necessary to hurt women in the name of social progressivism is wrong. So I don't like this amendment, and I'm going to vote no on the amendment because the bill is good. The bill is clear. It states what 99% of all American men and American women know is that is true, a right that we've fought for, a right that women now have. To take that away from them is cruel, it's unjust, and it's, again, not to be repetitive, it is just outright damn wrong. And I don't know how others feel. I think I do know how some feel, but we're tired of it. We're tired of all this. I want to know that my granddaughter, if she wants to compete in a women's sport, has a fair and equal chance. That's, part, that's my idea of civil rights. I yield back, Chairman. The gentleman yields back. Well said. The, uh, the question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from uh, Texas. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. No. Opinion of the chair, the no's have it. The recorded vote has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. No. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Issa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey. Mr. Roy. Mr. Bishop. Ms. Sparks? No. Ms. Sparks votes no. Mr. Fitzgerald? Mr. Benz? Mr. Benz votes no. Mr. Klein? Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Armstrong? Mr. Armstrong votes no. Mr. Gooden? Mr. Van Drew? No. Mr. Van Drew votes no. Mr. Nels? Mr. Moore? Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley? Ms. Hageman? No. Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran? Ms. Lee, Mr. Hunt, Mr. Fry, Mr. Nadler, Aye. 
Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren? Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee? Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen? Mr. Johnson? Mr. Schiff? Mr. Swalwell? Mr. Liu? Mr. Liu votes aye. Ms. Jayapal? Aye. Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Mr. Correa? Aye. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon? Mr. Nagus? Mr. Nagus votes aye. Ms. McBath? Ms. McBath votes aye. Ms. Dean? Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Escobar? Ms. Escobar votes aye. Ms. Ross? Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush? Mr. Ivey? Mr. Ivey votes aye. Ms. Ballant? Ms. Scanlon, you are not recorded. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Gooden votes no. Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 13 ayes and 13 noes. The, the amendment is not adopted. Question is on the adoption of the amendment in the nature of a substitute. This will be followed immediately by a vote on reporting the bill. Mr. Chairman. Okay, we will back up. The gentlelady from Texas has an amendment. And she is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have well, wait, amendment. Hang on a second. The clerk will report. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Not objection. The amendment will be considered as read. The gentlelady is now. Point of order from the gentleman from Arizona. The gentlelady is now recognized to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to introduce an amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute on this resolution. To be clear, this bill does nothing to truly protect women's equality in sports. This bill isn't about protecting women, it's about attacking, attacking the trans community. The majority's decision to mark up this bill is an unnecessary, cynical, and dangerous political stunt. It is designed solely to stoke fear against an especially vulnerable and small minority group. House Republicans are advancing this bill against the backdrop of a broader right-wing campaign. Since 2018, lawmakers have filed roughly 1,500 anti-LGBTQ bills with an increasing number targeting the transgender community specifically. In 2023, anti-trans bills set a national record for the fourth year in a row with 589 bills introduced in state legislatures to restrict transgender rights. This is shameful. Republicans have attempted to restrict access to gender-affirming health care, permit religious exemptions to allow discrimination against transgender people, bar transgender people from updating their identity documents, restrict school discussions on sexual orientation and gender, and deny transgender students equal access to school bathrooms, facilities, and activities. Republican efforts have gone as far as to track students' menstrual cycles, a proposal put forth most prominently by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis as a roundabout way of discriminating against trans students and subjecting students to invasive government mandates requiring them to submit personal medical records. This has unequivocally resulted in harm to transgender people. Just last month, a horrific tragedy occurred when 16-year-old high school sophomore Nex Benedict was assaulted and beaten by fellow students in a public school bathroom and died the next day. Nex, who was TNB, or transgender and non-binary, was consistently bullied for their identity with reports stating that the school district did nothing to respond. The assault and subsequent death of Nex is an inevitable result of the hateful rhetoric and discriminatory legislation targeting trans youth. Alarmingly, over one in five hate crimes being committed are motivated by anti-LGBTQ plus bias. 
The last three years have been the deadliest on record for transgender people, according to the FBI's annual crime report of 2021, 2022, and 2023. It is up to us to prevent these harmful policies and rhetoric from putting transgender students and youth at even greater risk. Earlier, one of our colleagues across the aisle said, we've got to protect women's rights. We know that that is quite the opposite of what the Republican Party is trying to do. The Republican Party doesn't care about women's rights, seeks to strip women of their hard-earned rights. This is about bullying. To that end, my amendment, which is based on Representative Schiff's Period Act, would prevent educational institutions from soliciting and requiring any student to provide reproductive or sexual health information, including information regarding the student's menstrual cycle, which has been used as a tool to overtly discriminate against trans students and subject all students to invasive government mandates of their private medical data. For everyone here who has a daughter, a school-aged daughter, I want you to think about how invasive it is to have the government force her to provide information about her period. I hope that you all are as outraged as we are. I urge you to support this amendment. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The gentlelady from Wyoming is recognized. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this amendment has absolutely nothing to do with the bill and is frankly very silly. Uh, there is no invasive government mandate associated with the bill. The in, determining sex isn't difficult. It does not require invasive physical screening. We all know that. In fact, as shown by the U.S. Boxing Association's transgender policy, the only time that there would be a necessity of this type of invasive screening is when we do allow men or boys to participate in women's and girls' sports. Um, there, this uh, amendment is absolutely unnecessary. It is not uh, related to the underlying bill, and I would urge my colleagues to reject it and vote no. With that, I yield back. Question occurs on the... Generally yields back. The question, the point of order is withdrawn. The question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from Texas. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. In opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Roll call. Roll call being requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. No. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Issa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy. Mr. Bishop. Ms. Sparts. Ms. Sparts votes no. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Benz. Mr. Benz votes no. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong votes no. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Gooden votes no. Mr. Van Drew. Mr. Van Drew votes no. Mr. Nels. Mr. Moore, Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley, Ms. Hageman, Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran, Ms. Lee, Ms. Hunt, Mr. Hunt, Mr. Fry, Mr. Nadler, aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren, aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee, aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Schiff, Mr. Swalwell, Mr. Swalwell votes aye. Mr. Liu, Ms. Jayapal, Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Mr. Correa, Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon, Mr. Nagoose, Mr. Nagoose votes aye. Ms. McBath, Ms. McBath votes aye. Ms. Dean, Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Escobar, Ms. Escobar votes aye. Ms. Ross. Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush. Ms. Bush votes aye. Mr. Ivey. Mr. Ivey votes aye. Ms. Ballant. Mr. Gates votes no.
Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 13 ayes and 14 noes. The amendment is not adopted. Mr. Chairman. Je uh, ranking members are recommended. Unanimous consent request. We've already closed. I'm, I apologize. We've already closed it. Um, do, you have an, do you have an amendment or were you just trying to vote, Ms. Gaylor? Oh, sorry. Okay. We, we'd already taken it and lost by, lost by a vote. But I take the ranking member has been recognized for a unanimous consent request. Both over. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent. To include into the record a letter from the Women's Sports Foundation, National Women's Law Center, and 50 other women's rights, gender justice, sports governance organizations in opposition to H.R. 7187. A letter from LGBTQ, civil liberties and civil rights organizations, including the Human Rights Campaign, Legal, Lambda Legal, the National Center for, for Transgender Equality, the PFLAG National, and Reproductive Freedom for All in Opposition to H.R. 7187. A letter from the American Civil Liberties Union in opposition to H.R. 7187, and a letter from Inter Ad Interact Advocates for Intersex Youth in opposition to H.R. 7187. Without objection. Question now occurs on, I think, the amendment in the nature of a substitute. This will be followed by. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yep. Can I offer an article? Uh, you sure can, consent? Mr. Ivey. I apologize. Uh, the Men Who Practice Against Caitlin Clark Can't Stop Her Either by Brian Hamilton. Without objection. Uh, the question is by a vote on reporting the bill. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment in the nature of a substitute is adopted. A reporting quorum being present. The question is on favorably reporting the bill. As amended, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have roll it. Roll call, please. Roll call having been requested, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Isa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Aye. Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Biggs. Aye. Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock. Aye. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Tiffany. Aye. Mr. Tiffany votes aye. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Roy. Mr. Bishop. Ms. Sparks, Ms. Sparks votes yes. Mr. Fitzgerald, aye. Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Benz, Mr. Benz votes yes. Mr. Klein, aye. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Armstrong votes yes. Mr. Gooden, Mr. Gooden votes yes. Mr. Van Drew, yes. Mr. Van Drew votes yes. Mr. Nels, Mr. Moore, Mr. Moore votes yes. Mr. Kiley, Ms. Hageman, yes. Ms. Hageman votes yes. Mr. Moran. Ms. Lee, Mr. Hunt, Mr. Fry, Mr. Nadler. No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren. No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee. No. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen. No. Mr. Cohen votes no. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Swalwell? No. Mr. Swalwell votes no. Mr. Liu? Ms. Jayapal? Ms. Jayapal votes no. Mr. Correa? Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon? Ms. Scanlon votes no. Mr. Nagoose? Mr. Nagoose votes no. Ms. McBath? Ms. Dean? Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. Escobar? Ms. Escobar votes no. Ms. Ross? Ms. Ross votes no. Ms. Bush? Ms. Bush votes no. Mr. Ivey? No. Mr. Ivey votes no. Ms. Ballant? Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Moran, you are You're not recorded. Texas. Yes. Mr. Moran votes yes. Ms. Yep. McBath, you're not recorded. Gentlemen. Ms. McBath votes no. Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 16 ayes and 15 noes. 
The ayes have it and the bill is ordered to be reported favorably to the House. Members will have two days to submit views. Without objection, the bill will be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute, incorporating all adopted amendments, and the staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes. Pursuant to notice, uh, I call up H.R. 7198, the Prove It Act of 2024 for purposes of markup and move the committee report it favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 719. Without objection, the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Moran, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. H.R. 7198, the Prove It Act of 2024, is an important bipartisan piece of legislation which would amend the Regulatory Flexibility Act of 1980. The bill is intended to ensure that agencies comply with existing law and better account for how their regulations may affect small businesses. It's no secret that small businesses bear a heavy burden when complying with federal regulations. This is especially true when agencies enact poorly designed, one-size-fits-all rules. Small businesses, though, often lack the resources to employ the lawyers and compliance professionals that larger businesses routinely keep on staff. <laughs> this means that small business owners are often their own compliance professionals. When small businesses must comply with such rules, it just doesn't hurt their bottom line. It also means that American people pay higher prices Rather than deal with regulation and unnecessary compliance costs, some would-be entrepreneurs will never pursue their goals in the first place. Put simply, poorly designed regulations deter innovation and competition, and they are barriers to entry. Regulators should seek to avoid these outcomes because we want to encourage small business growth. In 1980, Congress passed the Regulatory Flexibility Act of 1980, known as the RFA which required agencies to take small businesses into account when writing rules. All too often, though, agencies failed to comply with the RFA. One report found that in 75% of rulemakings, the agencies either, quote, ignored costs on small businesses or underestimated the regulation's cost, end quote. That is unacceptable. Regardless of whether someone believes the United States economy would be better with more or less regulation, we should have broad support for well-crafted, narrowly tailored regulation and transparency about its impact on small businesses. H.R. 7198, the Prove It Act of 2024, would help ensure agencies more carefully craft their regulations as the law requires. This bill allows small businesses to petition the Small Business Administration to investigate whether an agency performed the analysis the RFA requires. It also creates a penalty for agencies that fail to comply. Congress passed the RFA over 40 years ago, yet federal agencies still fail to account for their effects, the effects of their regulations on small businesses. The Prove It Act of 2024 is necessary and it has bipartisan support, and I urge my colleagues to support this legislation, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the ranking member is recognized for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the Prove It Act is yet another example of Republicans pretending to care about small businesses while actually doing the bidding of big corporations and other special interests. This legislation represents the latest effort by Republicans to dismantle the regulatory process, giving the biggest companies a powerful new cudgel to wield against regulations and causing harm to the very small entities it purports to help. Our regulatory agencies are responsible for writing rules that protect our communities from harm. They make sure that our toys that our children play with are safe. They make sure that the vehicles we drive and the buildings we live in are up to code. They make sure that the legislation we pass in Congress, tackling issues like climate change and public health, are implemented as we intend. But the Prove It Act would grind all of this to a halt. If this legislation is enacted, every single rule, past, present, and future, would be funneled for review through a single individual official in a chronically underfunded office within the Small Business Administration. Any group that merely purports to represent small businesses could petition this one official to block a pending rule they don't like. There would be no limit to how many times they could do this. Rules that would ban toxic chemicals or take contaminated food out of the market would hang in limbo, while petitions mount before this single official to complete their reviews, if they can ever complete them at all. And who would be charged with this awesome responsibility over our regulatory system? It's unclear since the SBA has not even filled this position 
since 2017. Beyond requiring this official to review petitions related to new rules, the bill also charges them with tracking agencies' completion of mandatory reviews of existing rules every 10 years. If they find that an agency failed to conduct the required review of a rule, they can simply suspend operation of the rule. This is a recipe for chaos and dysfunction. And that, of course, is the point. Republicans don't want to empower the agencies that ensure the drugs we take are safe, that ensure child car seats protect the most vulnerable among us, and that enforce our competition laws to ensure that small business has a chance to thrive. They want to throw sand in the gears of these agencies to ensure that they never issue the regulations we depend on to keep us safe. This bill will, will do little to help small businesses, but for powerful companies and special interests, it could be, prove to be a windfall. I urge my colleagues to join me in opposing this bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Um, without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas for the purpose of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7 Without objection, the amendment in the nature of a substitute will be considered as read and shall be considered base text for the purpose of the amendment. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas to explain the amendment. Mr. Chairman, quickly, this amendment simply makes minor changes to the bill. It clarifies the meaning of the bill and makes it more easily understood. Uh, this amendment is not intended in any way to alter the in important purpose of this bill. I urge support for this amendment. And before I yield back, I would like to ask for unanimous consent uh, for several uh, documents be entered into the record. The first is a March 20, 2024 letter from uh, Freedom Fighters uh, to the chairman and ranking member. Objection. Uh, the second, Mr. Chairman, is uh, from a February 5th, 2024 letter in support of this bill from NAFA. Objection. The third is a February 1, 2024 letter to the Honorable Brad Finstead in support of this letter, uh, in support of this bill from NFIB. Without objection. The fourth is from NSSGA, the National Stone and Gravel Association, dated February 29th, 2024, again, a letter in support. Without objection. Next, Mr. Chairman, a February 6, 2024 letter from ICBA in support of this letter, in support of this legislation. Without objection. And uh, two more, Mr. Chairman, February 1, 2024, letter to uh, several committees in support of this letter on behalf of a number of state, regional, and local chambers from across the nation. Without objection. And finally, a, an article that's titled, Energy and Environment Rules Dominate the Week. This is from AAF Week and Regulation, dated March 18th, 2024, with Dan Goldbeck being the, the author. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? I think the first hand was the gentleman from Maryland, then we'll come to Mr. Correa. Uh, the gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I have questions for my, my colleague on, on this, because um, I'm not exactly clear on the scope of what would be under the purview of the Chief Counsel for Advocacy of the Small Business Administration. Um, and what, what's... What's the purpose here? I mean, what, what are the types of regulations that you're trying to get at? And I, I yield to my colleague. Thank you for that important question because the, the issue here is uh, as regulations come up from here on out, uh, we wanna give small businesses the opportunity, regardless of whether or not we define them in specific scope today, if they have an impact on those businesses, a substantial impact or a significant economic impact to a substantial number of small entities, then those entities should have the right to actually understand what the impact of that um, regulation proposed is gonna be and then seek redress for it. And frankly, it goes back to that original RFA legislation and we today simply are saying, we want our agencies to follow the law. We want our agencies to do the thing that they were already mandated, mandated to do um, well, several let, decades ago. If, if I could, so how many regulations, or let's say in the previous year, what, what's the number of regulations or rules that this entity would have been uh, potentially called upon to review? Because I'm, I'm guessing thousands, but, you know. 
Yeah, it likely is thousands because when we look at 75% of these regulations not having had this analysis, uh, there certainly is uh, a burden put on the, the administrative state to, to justify the regulation. But I think that's part of the, the issue here is we do not want our regulatory agencies to run in, run amok and get into a situation where they begin to run over our small businesses without evaluating and putting out that information on the front end. All right, let me just one other question, because I noted the, the ranking member noted that this position hadn't been filled in, I guess, the past seven years, um, which, you know, makes me wonder about sort of the, the nature of this office. I mean, how big is this office? How big is the staff? What's the, what's the scope of what they're doing because if, you, if you're asking them to be able to review thousands of rules or regulations potentially, um, I would assume it's it's got to be a pretty sizable office, not just to handle the volume but the expertise and the scope of what they could potentially could be called to review. And I would defer to you. Yeah, and I thank the gentleman from uh, Maryland for that point because the fact that the office of the chief counsel has been vacant for so long is is telling really unfortunately, that this has not been important to the executive branch of the government to fulfill its obligations that already exist under law. And we need to either go back and say, well, we, we don't need them to do that, or we need to say, no, no, we, this was put in place for a reason, and that's what we're doing here today is decades ago when this uh, law went into place, it was for a specific reason, that's to protect small businesses. Let's make it actually happen. Let's give redress to our businesses. Okay, but I mean, if, if you pass the law first without building out the office, um, could that create sort of a bottleneck effect, which I think is, you know, one of the things that the ranking member raised. Uh, so, you know, again, potentially you could have a thousand plus, two, maybe 2,000 of these potentially. And certainly there's going to be people gaming this. Competitors will, you know, the reg came out that, you know, they think benefits their competitor, somebody else that might then want to challenge it. How do we build this out fast enough to make sure that it can move? Because I'm not seeing where, you know, those sorts of resources and uh, are, are added here. So... I'll, I'll defer again. You, you hit the nail on the head. Actually, it's about burden and resources because you're either going to place that burden on government, who by law has that burden to go into uh, right now, or you're going to put that burden on businesses who likewise do not have the resources to deal with these overly burdensome regulations as they come into place. So we do want to stop and pause and slow down before we roll out regulations uh, on small businesses that are going to impair their ability to grow. Well, fair enough. But if, 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 you, if you don't put in an apparatus that can handle this immediately, let's say somebody raises a challenge to a regulation currently, um, then they'd have to fight the regulation of the small, the small business would have to fight it under the current structure. But with this, you're adding a second layer of potential challenges where, if I'm reading the bill correctly, there's no infrastructure to handle it now. And then there'd still be the second layer to go through that is already in place. Isn't that right? Certainly, I think we need to evaluate that as it moves forward. But the step one is, let's make it happen. Let's put the onus on government. Let's put the burden on government, not on businesses. And then secondly, if we need more adjudication in that regard, let's see how it pans out. My time has expired. I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from Wyoming. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am very much in support of the Prove It Act and am proud to be a co-sponsor of this bill. The Regulatory Flexibility Act, or RFA, seeks to reduce the economic impact of agency regulation on small businesses. When proposed rules are found to have a significant impact on small businesses, the agency promulgating the rule must conduct an initial and final regulatory flexibility analysis. Unfortunately, this requirement is largely ignored on, on only half uh, com or only half completed by the agencies. For example, a report from the National Federation of Independent Businesses found that in 75% of rulemakings, the SBA determined that federal agencies either ignored costs on small business or underestimated the regulations cost. Let me provide an ongoing example of this issue and how the Prove It Act would remedy the situation. Currently, we are opposing an Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, or APHIS, proposed rule which would mandate the electronic surveillance of our nation's herds of cattle and bison. 
APHIS completed a brief two-page initial RFA analysis, which found that using the Small Business Administration's guidelines, that the majority of cattle operations in the United States are considered small. So in fact, this regulation would fall directly on them. After acknowledging that the proposed rule would almost entirely impact small businesses, the agency then wrote off these concerns with outdated and incorrect data. This entire analysis spans just two pages, is from nearly two years ago, and relies on the undervalued cost estimate of the proposed rule created by APHIS, an estimate which APHIS has not publicly shown how it was calculated. Just to give you an example of how important this particular issue is to our cattle and bison producers, in 2013, APHIS estimated that a, an RFID requirement would cost between 1.2 and 1.9 billion dollars, primarily against our small cattle producers. In 2019, they estimated that the cost would be 35 million dollars, and they did so by ignoring the vast majority of costs associated with implementing an RFID mandate. And in 2024, they've reduced that number even further, down to $26 million, again by ignoring almost all of the costs associated with implementing an RFID mandate. This is what these agencies do. They, when they do their analysis, they do everything in their power to try to underestimate the costs that are actually going to be borne by the regulated community. If APHIS's rule was finalized, it appears that APHIS would be on track to try to get around the final analysis requirements that it is currently required to comply with and impose one of the, uh, one of the most costly regulations against our cattle and bison producers in the history of the United States, all while ignoring their responsibility to report these details and actually provide a valid economic analysis. It would also give a voice under the Prove It Act, the reasonably foreseeable indirect cost analysis would have forced the agency to consider the additional cost burdens it is currently ignoring under this rule, such as the cost of the wants. Right now, the $26 million is just strictly the button in the ear. It does not include all of the related computer equipment, all of the wands, the retrofitting for our livestock producers that would be necessary to implement this rule. That's how they come up with $26 million versus the $1.2 billion that they estimate 11 years ago. Uh, this uh, APHIS, if, if they had to comply with the Prove It Act, they would actually have to disclo disclose the impact on the entire country through such mandate on our food produce producers. It would also give a voice to the ranchers and organizations which represent them to point out the obvious flaws in APHIS's proposal, flaws which myself and other ranching groups have been petitioning with, for, with OIRA, OIRA, OIRA. The shortcomings in the proposal stem from the agency's lack of industry expertise and stand, create a real challenge, would be challenged under the Prove It Act's empowering of small businesses to challenge the findings in the initial regulatory flexibility analysis. It should not have to be this way, and agencies must be held accountable for violating federal law to the detriment of America's small businesses. The Prove It Act merely updates and strengthens a law already on the books to the benefit of America's small businesses. I am again I'm proud to co-sponsor this legislation. I think it's extremely important to be protecting our small businesses from regulatory and federal overreach. The question of how much extra work it would be for these agencies to have to comply, my response to that is then perhaps they would be a bit more judicious in their efforts to overregulate over our, small our small businesses and, uh, and in fact, all of our businesses. Perhaps they would use their resources better in actually adopting regulations that were necessary rather than simply doing what they do now, which is uh, over-regulating every community, every uh, uh, business and industry in the country. So I encourage my colleagues to vote in favor of this incredibly important bill. Gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from California is recognized. Thank you, and i also uh, thank my colleague from Texas for I do the right thing for small businesses, but if I can, I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions, if I may, sir. Um, Office of Advocacy at the Small Business Administration. You would essentially put one person in charge of the operation. This agency is not just about small businesses. It could also be used by large businesses. Large businesses have lobbyists have trade organizations that represent them. Small businesses like the ones on Main Street in your district as well as mine don't have 
major representation. They're just interested in essentially making payroll on a, day, on a week to week basis. So I'm trying to figure out under your legislation, are we going to have the same treatment of the small and large businesses, especially if the large businesses begin to challenge regulations that the small ones cannot? Well, Mr. Correa, great question because uh, presently, because of the nature and the difference of the size and the resources between big corporations and small, presently, you see already big corporations with lobbyists that line these halls that have the ability to get in front of regulations before they come into place. Small businesses do not have that ability. They do not have those resources, yet they have to bear the same or equal and frankly disproportionate burden as a result of those regulations when they come out. So this evens the playing field and gives small businesses the same voice at the table that large businesses already have in, in DC. Thank you, and support your intent. I'm just concerned that this actually does the opposite because what you've got is you already have, if you would say, uh, level playing field when it comes to resources. The level playing field, of course, does not exist. This does nothing to change in terms of who's there to advocate for the small businesses and to the large corporations. And the fact that you're essentially bottling up a lot of the regulations and not giving the small businesses the ability to work in this area, yet the large guys will be able to work in this area, I think actually will create an even worse playing level field, so to speak, or uneven playing field. Your thoughts? I just simply disagree with the gentleman from California. This actually provides the ability for small businesses to uh, go to the office of chief counsel and, and say in a relatively easy way, present their case and say, look, the, you, you haven't done your job here and there is a significant impact uh, to a substantial number of, of, ent of small entities as a result of this proposed regulation and you need to uh, do your due diligence and let us know what that impact is gonna be and, and I like that about your legislation. The problem is you put a single person in charge of the Office of Advocacy, which means you've essentially created a bottleneck. So your right to go and petition is really meaningless since you don't really have a way to petition. Well, they do, and there is a prima facie what? review. So if there's, if there's no basis for uh, the petition, of course, the chief counsel can make pretty good and pretty quick disposition of that, and then simply move those that have a substantial basis for their uh, petition to move on to a larger hearing. So it does provide um, I, access to our, our, our system. No, go, go ahead, finish. I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, I'm done. I just gonna say, I'd like to see that happen, but again, you change with this proposed legislation, you change the process, one person, one agency, without giving them more resources. So really, you've got, you're giving small businesses the ability, the right, but they won't be able to exercise it. I'd love to support it, but I'm just gonna have to say no on this one. Will, will the, the gentleman end. yield for a moment? Just yes, Korea? yes. I, I did want to, just as a, a quick question, as I'm, I'm looking through here, uh, regarding the, the, the focus on small businesses and entities, is, is small defined here according to SBA, uh, Department of Commerce? How, how is it defined? Uh, and does it uh, take into account the variations among different industries uh, that could come under uh, this jurisdiction? Uh, in answer to your question, I believe it's defined under the original act. Under, under the original 1980 act. Sorry, where are you? The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes. And I, uh, I want to engage in a colloquy with some of the proponents of the legislation. I, I think the goals are laudable to try to reduce the impact of, of agency and regulatory action on small businesses. But I am concerned because I envision a world in January of 2025 when Donald Trump is the president again and is putting is issuing executive orders and proceeding for more wall construction on the southern border and this bill if it were law could potentially bite those efforts like a border rattlesnake I fear and so maybe the proponents can uh, can dissuade my concerns but 
is there a world in which the well-intentioned and good-meaning provisions of this bill could impair executive action on border security? I'll yield to Ms. Hagan. Or Mr. Moran. Sorry, Mr. Chair, could, could sure. you repeat that? Yeah, just I, I want to give you the opportunity to, to dissuade my concerns that the provisions of this act could be utilized by a small business or a uh, nonprofit to impair executive action on border security. No, because we're not talking about um, executive action. We're talking about regulatory bur burdens uh, from the administrative state on businesses. And frankly, if, if, we're, uh, if we're going back to the original 10 of the 1980 uh, Regulatory Flexibility Act, which was the act I was referencing for you just a second ago uh, to the gentleman from Maryland, what we're talking about is, uh, are we going to uh, force our government to slow the regulatory process down uh, or not? Yeah, but, but the question is whether or not a, someone could slow down, not the regulatory process, but could slow down a regulation that is there to facilitate additional construction of a border wall. For example, if, you know, if uh, President Trump were to have to issue executive orders, if DHS were to have to engage in eminent domain or, if there, or some other regulatory act um, in concert with Texas or someone else, like, is there a world in which some nonprofit or small business could send the Trump administration off on some prove it wild goose chase while people are coming across our border. <coughs> I guess that's my question. Yeah, if the gentleman uh, is asking if uh, a, a bill that's passed by Congress can be misused or misinterpreted to thwart good activities, I would say that's always a possibility. Um, and certainly we do not intend this bill to be overly broad, but we need to provide a pause and a regulatory slowdown uh, that affects small businesses. So the intent is not to do that, certainly not. Uh, can we conceive of hypotheticals when that might happen? Um, well, I sus suspect we can conceive of many hypotheticals, but the reality is this is gonna preserve businesses' ability to grow uh, without the administrative state bringing down its heavy hammer on it. Uh, and, and if I may engage certainly. as well? Certainly. What this is is a good government bill, and it's about accountability and transparency, and all it does is re requires the regulatory agencies to actually disclose the cost of their regulations upon small businesses. So again, using the ear tag example, the, 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 the agency is attempting to minimize how much they say this, this is going to cost because they want to avoid having to do a more detailed analysis on the, of, of what the real cost to the regulated community, our cattle and bison producers would be. In the case of building the wall, it is, it is so long as the agency is actually disclosing the costs, then this doesn't necessarily even come into play. So it is a good governance bill requiring our agencies to be honest about the cost of the regulations that they are issuing. It would make me feel better if the general lady could, could just tell me that you, you can't envision a circumstance in which the provisions of this bill could be could be used to delay or otherwise impair uh, th those executive actions on border security. Is that, is that I, true? I am not foreseeing okay. what those would be. Great. I'm going to take my final moments to a point of personal privilege to recognize the esteemed former chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Mr. Smith of Texas. Uh, thanks for being here and uh, honoring us with your presence, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Who further seeks recognition? Mr. Andrew, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you. Real briefly, I mean, facts are a good thing. So the facts are that the cost of compliance for small business has grown very significantly. The fact is in 2001, it cost nearly as much as double what medium-sized businesses spent per employee to comply with federal regulations. By 2014, that number went up to five times as much as what uh, a medium-sized business does. And today, small businesses spend over seven times as much per employee as medium-sized businesses do for compliance. And the SBA reported, in one report, 75% of rulemakings, the SBA, a government agency, determined that federal agencies either ignored costs on small business or completely underestimated them. 
The Biden administration has even increased these costs more. The average annual cost of regulation is estimated to be, in a small business now, $14,000 per employee. It's a lot of money, and it's hard on small business. Entrepreneurship starts with small business. Entrepreneurship and small business, I state the obvious, is what built this great country. This bill goes in the right direction. I believe it's a good thing, and I will be supporting it. And I really mean it on this one. I would hope there'd be bipartisan support. I mean, if there's a, a little tiny bit more to be done, that's great. Want me to yield? I yield to Ms. Hagman. One other statistic that I think is important is that on average, agency, agencies underestimate the cost of their regulations by 40%. So to the extent that any agency identifies a regulation as being significant, meaning it will have an economic impact of over $100 million, you can assume that the actual economic impact of that regulation is $140 million. All we're attempting to do with this regulation is force the agencies to be more accurate in their calculations of the impact on our small businesses. I also would, would hope that we would have bipartisan support for this. Again, it's a good governments, governance and transparency bill that I think is, is in the best interest of our small businesses across this country. Thank you, and with that, I yield back. Gentleman lady yields back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, for what purposes is the gentleman from New York seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HRs. Mm -hmm. The gentleman from Arizona reserves support of order. Offered by Mr. Nadler of New York. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman from New York is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I won't take five minutes. It's very simple. My amendment would strike the provision requiring analysis of indirect costs as part of the periodic review required under this bill. As I noted in my opening statement, this legislation would stall the work of government by requiring the periodic review of rules, rules that have long been law to analyze any, quote, indirect costs that may have been, that may have arisen in the past decade since the rule was promulgated. Indirect costs are extremely hard to measure and can be highly misleading. Moreover, agencies need far more resources to do their job if we are going to impose this extra burden on them. We should not be bogging down our already under-resourced agencies with nearly impossible tasks. And that's why my amendment would strike the provision requiring analysis of indirect costs as part of the periodic review. I ask my colleagues to support the amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Does the gentleman from Arizona withdraw his point of order? Point of order is withdrawn. I'll recognize myself in opposition to the amendment to just suggest that it's the periodic review that is necessary to clean out a lot of the dead wood in the regulatory code. And while my concerns uh, were with some of the, the proactive natures, being, you know, going through uh, some of the costs that small businesses have been burdened with for year after year, decade after decade, seem to be the most laudable provisions of the bill. And I'll yield to the gentlelady from uh, Wyoming with any, any thoughts she may have in opposition. And in fact, in defining indirect costs is the way that the, defining costs as indirect is one of the ways in which the agencies hide what an actual cost of a regulation will be. And I will again use the example of the RFID requirement. The radio frequency identification is a button or an ear tag placed in the ear of either the cattle or the, or the bison that are, that are being herded. And, but all of that, that, that button or that ear tag is absolutely irrelevant and does nothing unless you have all of the related equipment to be able to read that ear tag. So you're going to have to have the wand, you're going to have to have the computer equipment, you're going to have to have the software, you're going to have to be able to, ha to, to be handling the cattle and bison to actually put the ear tag on. So all of those costs are identified as indirect costs because they're not the actual RFID, but they absolutely are a cost associated with that regulation. It is getting at the indirect cost that is so important, and it's why the Prove It Act, again, is a good, trans a good governance bill based upon transparency and accountability because it is forcing the agencies to actually disclose to the American public the real cost of their regulations on small businesses. In light of the importance of small businesses to the economic powerhouse that the United States is, I would think everyone would want to know what the cost of these regulations are. With that, I yield. I'll, I'll uh, yield to Mr. Moran. I'll yield to the gentleman from Texas right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to follow up on that, I just want to tell you, as a, a former business owner, indirect costs are real costs to business owners. 
And, and we take those into consideration when we are determining whether or not we're going to invest and grow or even start a business. So those indirect costs are extremely important to understand. For that reason, I oppose this amendment. I also find it ironic that oftentimes those on the other side of the aisle seek to require an examination of indirect climate costs uh, across the board for, uh, for businesses. And in this case, uh, indirect costs, again, are real things that business owners have to take into, uh, into consideration when they are deciding whether or not to start or grow or invest and whether or not they can survive. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I yield back. The question is on the adoption of the amendment, the nature of a substitute, I'm sorry, uh, the, on the adoption of the amendment. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. Aye. All the opposed, no. 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 Speaking Chair, the noes have it. Okay. Gentleman from New York, request roll call. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. No. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Issa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy. Mr. Bishop. Ms. Sparts. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Benz. Mr. Klein, Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Armstrong votes no. Mr. Gooden, Mr. Van Drew, Mr. Van Drew votes no. Mr. Nels, Mr. Moore, Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley, Mr. Kiley votes no. Ms. Hageman, Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran, Mr. Moran votes no. Ms. Lee, Mr. Hunt, Mr. Fry, Mr. Nadler, Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren? Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee? Mr. Cohen? Mr. Johnson? Mr. Schiff? Mr. Swalwell? Mr. Swalwell votes aye. Mr. Liu? Ms. Jayapal? Mr. Correa? Ms. Scanlon? Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Nagus. Ms. McBath. Ms. Dean. Ms. Escobar. Ms. Escobar votes aye. Ms. Ross. Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivy. Mr. Ivy votes aye. Ms. Ballant. Ms. from Pennsylvania. Ms. Dean, you are not recorded. Ms. Dean votes aye. The lady from Texas. Ms. Jackson Lee, you are not recorded. Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Gentleman from Oregon. Mr. Benz votes no. Report. Mr. Chairman, there are nine ayes and 14 noes. Uh, the amendment is not adopted. The ranking member is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I have another amendment to the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Point of order reserved by the gentleman from Florida. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. No objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman, uh, the ranking member is recognized to explain his amendment. Mr. Chairman, my amendment would strike the provision in the bill that requires nullification of a rule if an agency does not complete a review of that rule under the strict requirements set forth in the bill. Each year, the federal government promulgates anywhere from 3,500 to 4,000 rules, rules that do everything from ensuring that we have clean air and clean water, safe transportation, and life-saving medications that are safe and effective. The bill requires every agency to conduct a review of each rule after 10 years, or else the rule is nullified. This would not only overburden our agencies, but it would also lead to chaos and risks within the markets and sectors affected by that nullified rule. And it would require many more uh, civil servants within the agencies to conduct the, the, uh, the reviews. Further, this nullification requirement would require agencies to devote significant time to these review proceedings, leaving them with far fewer resources to respond to changing and emerging problems, which would leave us all less safe. I ask my colleagues to support the amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Texas recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I oppose this amendment, and uh, I would just have to say to the ranking member that if it is important enough to institute or keep a regulation, it is important enough to understand the impact of such regulation on small businesses and to comply with the existing mandates of the 1980 Regulatory Flexibility Act. I know the ranking member and, and others will, will want to uh, bring up life-saving regulations uh, that may be impacted by this, and, and truly that's, that's not the case because, again, if it is that important, if it is really life-saving in its nature, then the administrative agency will do its due diligence, will understand the impact on small businesses, and will follow through as the 1980 law currently requires, and there has to be some redress there has to be some accountability for government. We know that if we do not uh, put in place accountability for government to do, its, to do what it, it's already required to do, then it is simply not gonna do it. And we know that from the statistics I cited earlier, 75% either are not estimated at all or underestimated as to the impact of uh, these regulations on small businesses. So we've gotta hold government accountable. And that means we've gotta put in place some redress Again, if it's important enough for the regulation to stay in place, the government will do its job and will go through these steps and indicate what the impact will be on small businesses. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New York. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no, no. In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Roll call. Uh, the gentleman requests a roll call vote. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. No. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Issa. Mr. Buck. Yeah. Mr. Gates. No. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock. No. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy. Mr. Bishop. Ms. Sparks. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Bentz. Mr. Benz votes no. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong votes no. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Van Drew. No. Mr. Van Drew. Mr. Van Drew votes no. Mr. Nels. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley. Mr. Kiley votes no. Ms. Hageman. No. Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran. Yes. Mr. Moran votes no. Ms. Lee. Mr. Hunt, Mr. Fry, Mr. Nadler, aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren, aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee, Mr. Cohen, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Schiff, Mr. Swalwell, Mr. Liu, Ms. Jayapal, Mr. Correa, aye. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon, Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Nagoose, Ms. McBath, Ms. McBath, Ms. McBath votes aye. Ms. Dean, Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Escobar, Ms. Escobar votes aye. Ms. Ross, Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivey, Mr. Ivey votes aye. Ms. Ballant. Ms. Sparts, Ms. Sparts votes no. LA from Texas. Ms. Jackson Lee, you are not recorded. Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Issa, you are not recorded. Mr. Issa votes no. Clerk will report. 
Mr. Chairman, there are 10 ayes and 16 noes. The amendment is not adopted. One final round from the gentleman from New York. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report. Board of order reserved by the gentleman from Florida. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Objection. The amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman from New York is recognized to explain his amendment. Mr. Chairman, my amendment would exempt rules related to environmental permits under the Clean Water and Clean Air Acts from the periodic review required under this bill. As I noted in my opening statement, this legislation would stall the work of government by requiring the periodic review of rules, rules that have long been law to determine any indirect costs that may have arisen in the past decade since the rule was promulgated. At a time when climate change is already wreaking havoc worldwide, we should not make it harder for agencies to protect our environment and our health. Indirect costs are a notably hazy concept, and we should not bog down our expert agencies with the nearly impossible task of determining such costs at the risk of preventing life-saving regulations from coming into effect. Yes, and my colleagues support the amendment. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I oppose this amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by Mr. Nadler. Uh, as stated earlier, this is precisely why we need this uh, legislation in place today that we're moving forward with is because there are so many regulations going into place that are impacting small businesses, including uh, these environmental permits under the Clean Air Act, if we're, if we're looking at the regulatory burdens that are being uh, pushed upon our small businesses by an environmental and climate change agenda, it is crushing small business. And so to uh, take that out of this legislation and to say, yeah, but we're gonna, we're gonna undo uh, one of the larger parts of the regulatory burden that the administrative states puts on uh, puts on small businesses. We're going to undo the process to to make sure that we evaluate those burdens and evaluate those regulations before they go into place. I think is misguided. As a result, I oppose. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from New York. I have unanimous unanimous consent request. I ask that this uh, unanimous consent that this letter from Earth to Justice in support of the act be. Uh, in opposition to the act, I'm sorry, be put into the record. Gentle lady objects. Um, question occurs on the amendment from the gentleman from New York. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. And opinion of the chair: the Those have a roll call being requested. The clerk call the roll. Mr. Jordan. No. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Isa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy. Mr. Bishop. Ms. Sparts. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Benz. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong votes no. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Van Drew. Mr. Van Drew votes no. Mr. Nels. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley. Mr. Kiley votes no. Ms. Hageman. No. Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran. No. Mr. Moran votes no. Ms. Lee. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Fry. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee. Ms. Jackson Lee. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Liu. Ms. Jayapal. Mr. Correa. Aye. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Nagoose. Ms. McBath. Aye. Ms. McBath votes aye. Ms. Dean. Aye. Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Escobar. Aye. Ms. Escobar votes aye. Ms. Ross. Aye. Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivy. Aye. Mr. Ivy votes aye. Ms. Ballant. Aye. 
Gentleman from California. Mr. Issa votes no. Ms. Sparks votes no. Mr. Benz votes no. Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 10 ayes and 16 noes. The amendment is not adopted. Who seeks recognition? General from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk report. I res re reserve a point of order. General California reserves point of order. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a Without objection. Substitute. It'll be considered as read. The gentleman from George is recognized to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my amendment will take into account the importance and necessity regarding rules related to children's health and safety in the Prove It Act by exempting them from Section 4A2. As I remarked in yesterday's hearing, we need the expertise of our regulatory agencies when reviewing rule challenges. Our agencies serve as protection for Americans in so many different ways. We cannot and we should not take away the authorities that allow them to do their job. As a mother and a nurturer, I take solace in knowing that there are experts that are reviewing and regulating rules pertaining to children's health and their safety across this country and in Congress and across our government, Maybe. we should really be putting people over profits. We should not overburden a single agency with agency rule challenges simply because big business would like to turn a larger profit. I will always be the loudest voice on this hill for our children's health and safety because it's really at stake. And as a mother, I would never, ever, ever put a check of any kind over the health, the welfare, and safety of my child. Children are a blessing and they truly are a privilege. And why should we sit here and agree to risk the lives of our future? I am proposing this amendment because I really care about our children and I really care about their futures because I no longer have my own to care for. And I believe, and I place a charge in everyone in this room to really focus on our children. Until you don't have your children anymore, you cannot even understand what it means. So I urge my colleagues to vote in favor of this very necessary exemption. Think about our children. And I yield back. General Lady yields back. Gentleman from Texas, recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I oppose this amendment, Mr. Chairman. And I thank the gentle lady for her concern for our children and for, uh, for this thoughtful amendment. However, I must oppose because we are not, in her words, taking away the authorities of these regulatory agencies. In fact, we are saying you are to do the job you were commanded to do in 1980 under the Regulatory Flexibility Act. I've got four children of my own, 19 down to six, and I'm concerned about every aspect of their health and safety. But I also realize that long term, uh, as we weigh these decisions, we have to weigh them with the understanding of how they're going to impact our businesses and our economy because the growth and economy helps all, and getting all out of poverty certainly helps the health and welfare and safety of our children long term. Again, we're, we're talking about just making the agencies do the things that they have already been commanded to do for 44 years. We're not on the front end of this making agencies do something they weren't already supposed to do. We're providing redress for small businesses that don't already have redress uh, presently because they don't have the resources to come to D.C. and to weigh in on these matters before they happen like biz big businesses do. We're giving them a voice in Washington, D.C., I'm more concerned about overly burden, over burdensome nature of regulatory action on businesses in contrast to the term uh, the gentle lady used, and that was she was concerned about overburdening our agencies. It's businesses, not agencies, that I'm most concerned with. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentle lady from California. Uh, I move to strike the last one. Gentle lady is recognized. I, w I want to thank the gentlelady from 
uh, Georgia for offering this amendment. I think all of us have small businesses in our district. We care about them. We want to help them. That's really not the issue. The issue is whether this is the most effective way to do that, number one. And number two, whether there are some things where you just want to go, you don't want the benefit of the doubt. And you think about some of the products that have threatened children just in recent times. Um, my, uh, I found myself hunting for a baby formula for a member of my family every place I went because baby formula had been tainted. And uh, we don't want anything that is ingested by an infant to pose a threat to them. And I'm sure that's true for every member of this committee on both sides of the aisle. I, there's no doubt about that. Think about some of the other things, products, that have harmed children. Cribs. You know, to the point where you can't really give away an old crib because the way they're designed, they were originally designed, infants could get their head stuck and kill themselves. So these are the types of products that you want to make sure, you know, don't ever make it to the market. And if there are regulations that are uh, put in place, we don't want to impede or deter or to hinder or to slow up any of those regulations. You know, I thought it was um, encouraging that the first bill we took up this morning was, I think it was unanimous and it was bipartisan. And it was to protect children from uh, exploitation. We all are in that spot. And I think, uh, and I don't question the sincerity of the author of this bill, but I do think that the amendment offered by the gentlelady is an important carve out. Um, and I know, you know, I'm not going to uh, certainly uh, impair uh, or in any way insinuate that members who don't support the amendment are in favor of hurting children. But every year, the uh, child say the uh, consumer product safety uh, groups come out with toys that that kill children, and we usually have a a press conference in my district to alert parents and grandparents that these toys that are on the market pose a hazard to the, the little people who they hold most dear in their entire life. So I, I do think um, streamlining, uh, deterring, uh, s uh, slowing down in any way efforts to preserve the safety and health and well-being of children uh, is is an important goal. And I, I thank the gentlelady for the amendment. I'm, I'm glad that she offered it, and I intend to support it. And Mr. Chairman, I thank you for recognizing me, and I, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The question occurs on the amendment offered by the gen gentleman from Virginia who wants to speak on the amendment. Yeah, move to strike the last word quickly. The gentleman's recognized. And I, I just think that uh, I thank the gentlelady for the amendment. We all want to look out for health and safety of children. I, I think we need to look at this a little bit differently. No agencies are exempt from the RFA right now. So if you carve out um, portions from the Prove It Act, then you're going to have uh, a lack of uh, essentially enabling the RFA uh, to identify and call out inadequate agency analysis this primary purpose of this bill is to help ensure agencies comply properly with the RFA. So really, it's gonna have the inverse effect of your intent, where you're gonna have uh, health and safety laws affecting kids or regs affecting kids that are not going to get that look under uh, the RFA or under the Prove It Act. And if an agency takes issue with the Prove It Act, it may be because that agency is unlikely to comply with the RFA to begin with. So since no agencies are exempt from the RFA, they shouldn't be exempt from this act either. And for consistency's sake, and to make sure that we do actually enforce the regulations that affect health and safety of kids, I would urge that we reject this amendment. Okay, Mr. Uh, Chairman. We got votes on the Mr. floor. Chairman, I, I withdraw my reservation. The point of order is withdrawn. Let's, uh, if, if it's okay, we're gonna take a vote on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no, no. Can, in the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Uh, recorded vote being requested. We'll do a recorded vote and then we'll uh, recess for votes.
Mr. Jordan. No. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Issa. Mr. Issa votes no. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy. Mr. Bishop. Ms. Sparts. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Bentz. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Van Drew. Mr. Van Drew votes no. Mr. Nels. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley. Mr. Kiley votes no. Ms. Hageman. No. Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran. No. Mr. Moran votes no. Ms. Lee. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Fry. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee. Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Liu, Ms. Jayapal, Mr. Correa, Ms. Scanlon, Ms. Scanlon votes aye, Mr. Nagus, Ms. McBath, Ms. McBath votes aye, Ms. Dean, Ms. Escobar, Ms. Escobar votes aye, Ms. Ross, aye. Ms. Ross votes aye, Ms. Bush, Mr. Ivy, aye. Mr. Ivy votes aye, Ms. Ballant. I'm from uh, Oregon. Mr. Benz votes no. Clerk for report. Mr. Chairman, there are eight ayes and 11 noes. The amendment is not adopted. The committee will stand in recess until 10 minutes after the close of votes in this vote series.
Chair recognizes Ms. Ballot from Vermont. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, we're getting our, our act together here. I'm gonna start your clock any minute now. <laughs> uh, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 7198 offered by Ms. Ballant of Vermont, page 11, line 23, insert after rule the following. Other than a rule related Without to Without objection, the amendment considered as Mr. Read. Chairman, a reserve port point of order. Gentlemen reserves. Then ladies recognized to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My amendment would exempt the National Labor Relations Board, the NLRB, from the provision in the bill that makes a rule ineffective if an agency fails to do a 10-year review. The NLRB is the crucial institution to protect the labor rights of American workers. It's also consistently under-resourced and already working at full capacity. If this bill is enacted, it's unlikely that they'll be able to comply with the bill. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, point of order is uh, withdrawn, but uh, to speak to that amendment, <clears throat> this is just like the prior amendments that were offered. What we're seeing here is an attempt by the other side of the uh, argument here to, uh, to exclude from the Regulatory Flexibility Act from 1980 uh, things that are already demanded of our federal agencies, and that is to look at the impact on small businesses. And so when we start making these carve-outs in this proposed bill here today, what it does is it, it effectively creates a carve-out from that prior bill that was passed by Congress and signed into law in 1980 that requires the federal agencies to look at the impacts on small businesses of each regulation before they go into place and to keep them in place under this particular rule if they are not, uh, if those... Uh, if those analyses are not done in the appropriate time. So it, it creates that sunset to say, look, if it's important, let's, let's follow the procedure, and then it stays in place. If it's not important, then uh, the agencies don't do what they're supposed to do, and then it rolls off the books. But back to my original point, the main point of today on these arguments is, if it is important enough to institute or keep the regulation, it is important enough to understand the impact of such regulation on small businesses and to comply with the existing 1980 law. With that, I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The 1980 bill is not at issue. What's at issue is the bill before us. The bill before us says that all agency, that all of these uh, regulations must be reviewed every 10 years by one person, the Office of Advocacy within the Office of General Counsel. One person who has to review tens of thousands of rules and regulations, which is impossible for him to do, obviously. Now, yes, that's why we're opposed to the bill. And yes, we're trying to have some carve-outs for where it would be most egregious. The NLRB, the subject of this amendment, if the NLRB couldn't enforce its rules because that individual, the Office of Advocate, the, the advocate could not get to it because he was reviewing tens of thousands of rules and he didn't get to the rules of the NLRB, the rules of the NLRB would expire under this bill. But the rules of the NLRB are what protect labor. Without the NLRB, there would be no labor union elections. There would be no collective bargaining. Well, there might be collective bargaining, but only if the employer wanted it. Because if he didn't want it, he could ignore, the, he could ignore it and the NLRB wouldn't be there to enforce any regulations. So that's why Ms. Balin's amendment is well taken to exempt the NLRB from the necessity for this one individual to review it and all its regulations every 10 years. And remember, there are tens of thousands of regulations. This individual can't possibly review them all and all the agencies, and that's why it's a bad bill. But at least the NLRB Let's exempt it from the bill so we're not telling uh, working people you don't have the right to form unions or you can't enforce the right to form unions. You can't enforce your rights to collective bargaining. You're at the mercy of your employer. We're back in 1890. I don't think we want to do that, and that's why we should adopt this amendment. Will the gentleman yield? Yes, I will. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from New York has based his argument in support of this amendment 
uh, on the argument that one individual is to review uh, these rules within the prescribed period of time when in fact the amendment points to page 11, line 23, and if you look at that line, it says if, the agency if an agency fails to conduct a review of a rule. So the review of the rule is not on the, on the onus of the chief counsel for advocacy, one person. It's on, the onus is on the agency generally. Again, uh, that's why this amendment is, is improper and should be um, opposed. I yield back. Lady from... <laughs> Um, I'll yield to the gentlelady from uh, Vermont. You know, I think it, it's been so clear as we've watched the growing income inequality in this country that we should be doing everything that we can uh -huh. at this moment to be supporting labor, supporting working people, and I feel like this amendment really speaks to the heart of that. And I yield back, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Chair recognizes Ms. Hageman. Just very briefly, Mr. Chairman, it is absolutely critical that the NLRB analyze the financial impact of its regulations on small businesses. Perhaps this is one of the most important agencies for this type of transparency and oversight. While I can understand the, the idea that, uh, of, of protecting labor, and I don't oppose that, without small businesses, we don't have jobs. And if we put the small businesses out of, uh, uh, out of business, uh, because of the onerous regulations issued by NLRB and other types of federal agencies, um, we're going to, uh, <laughs> I, I think, probably absolutely destroy our economy and destroy the very types of jobs that you're wanting to protect. So if there's any agency that should be subject to this type of oversight, okay. it's the NLRB. With that, I yield back. The lady yields back. Anybody else on the amendment? All right, the question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from Vermont. Those in favor say yes. Aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment no, is not please. agreed to, and the request, recorded vote is requested. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Issa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Biggs. Mr. McClintock. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Massey. Mr. Roy, Mr. Bishop, Ms. Sparts, Mr. Fitzgerald, Mr. Benz, Mr. Benz votes no, Mr. Klein, Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Gooden, Mr. Van Drew, Mr. Van Drew votes no, Mr. Nels, Mr. Moore, Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley? Ms. Hageman? No. Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran? No. Mr. Moran votes no. Ms. Lee? Mr. Hunt? No. Mr. Hunt votes no. Mr. Fry? Mr. Nadler? Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren? Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee? <coughs> Mr. Cohen? Mr. Johnson? Mr. Schiff, Mr. Swalwell, Mr. Liu, Ms. Jayapal, Mr. Correa, Ms. Scanlon, Mr. Nagoose, Ms. McBath, Ms. McBath votes aye, Ms. Dean, Ms. Escobar, Ms. Ross, Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush, Mr. Ivy, Ms. Ballant, Ms. Ballant votes aye. Mr. Jordan, Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Jordan votes no. You were right the first time. <laughs> Clark will report. No, 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 no. hold on.
We'll see. Yeah. Ms. Jayapal, you are not recorded. Ms. Jayapal votes yes. Okay, quality control seems to be lacking. Airbus is built in my district. I know this. Mr. McClintock, you are not recorded. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Johnson, you are not recorded. Mr. Johnson votes yes. Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are seven ayes and eight noes. The amendment is not adopted. Who seeks recognition? Without objection, I ask unanimous consent to enter a letter from the Job Creators Network uh, in support of the legislation. The question is on the adoption of the amendment in the nature of a substitute. This will be followed immediately by a vote on reporting the bill. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment in the nature of a substitute is adopted. A reporting quorum being present, the question is on favorably reporting the bill as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Roll call, please. The ranking member requests a roll call vote. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Issa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Biggs. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Massey. Mr. Roy. Mr. Bishop, Ms. Sparks, Mr. Fitzgerald, Mr. Benz, Mr. Benz votes yes, Mr. Klein, Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Gooden, Mr. Van Drew, Mr. Van Drew votes yes, Mr. Nels, Mr. Moore, Mr. Moore votes yes. Mr. Kiley, Mr. Kiley votes aye. Ms. Hageman, Ms. Hageman votes aye. Mr. Moran, Mr. Moran votes yes. Ms. Lee, Mr. Hunt, Mr. Fry, Mr. Nadler. No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren, Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee, Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson votes no. Mr. Schiff, Mr. Swalwell, Mr. Liu, Ms. Jayapal, Ms. Jayapal votes no. Mr. Correa, Ms. Scanlon, Mr. Nagoose, Ms. McBath, Ms. McBath votes no. Ms. Dean, Ms. Escobar, Ms. Ross, Ms. Ross votes no. Ms. Bush, Mr. Ivey, Ms. Ballant, Ms. Ballant votes no. Mr. Klein votes aye.
Mr. Massey, you are not recorded. Yes. Mr. Massey votes yes. Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Johnson, you're recorded as no.
Mr. Godin votes yes. Mr. Issa votes yes.
Mr. Fry, you're not recorded. Mr. Fry votes aye. Mr. Armstrong votes yes. Ms. Ganlin, you are not recorded. Ms. Ganlin votes no. Ms. Bush, you are not recorded. Ms. Bush votes no. Can we, can we report? Is from Florida? Ms. Lee votes yes. Gentlelady from Texas. Ms. Jackson Lee, you are not recorded. Ms. Jackson Lee, you are not recorded. I think you probably know. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 17 ayes and 10 noes. Uh, the ayes have it, and the bill is ordered to be reported favorably to the House. Members will have two days to submit views without objection. The bill will be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute incorporating all adopted amendments, and staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes. Purpose to, uh, pursuant to notice, I call up H.R. 661, Sarah's Law, for purposes of markup. Move that the committee report it favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 661. Without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock, for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Biden's America has become a nation without borders as it has deliberately released millions of illegal aliens into the country. Among the many terrible consequences are the growing number of assaults on the men and women sworn to protect and serve our communities, far-left prosecutors releasing those same criminals back onto our streets, sanctuary city policies shielding criminal aliens from accountability, illegal aliens robbing hardworking Americans, the tragic murder of a 22-year-old Georgia nursing student, and now again, we discuss another tragedy and a bill that bears another victim's name, Sarah's Law, named after 21-year-old Sarah Root. On January 31, 2016, as Sarah drove home after a day of celebrating her college graduation, an illegal alien who was street racing while drunk slammed into Sarah's SUV, snapping Sarah's spine and fracturing her skull. Sarah died days later on February 4th. Within hours of her death, 
A judge set the illegal alien's bond at $50,000. The illegal alien posted bond and was released the next day. The alien who murdered Sarah then absconded and to this day remains at large. Even though the alien was charged with motor vehicle homicide, the Obama administration refused to lodge a detainer against Sarah Root's killer. In fact, despite a request by Omaha, Nebraska police to obtain an immigration detainer for the illegal alien, the agency declined. According to a news report, I said the agency declined the detainer, quote, because the illegal alien had not been convicted of a criminal charge and was, quote, not an enforcement priority. At a 2016 hearing before the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, then ICE Director Sarah Saldana further attempted to justify the decision not to detain the man. She said, quote, an individual from ICE looked at the specific facts and circumstances related to that matter. Uh, the individual had no criminal convictions, previous criminal convictions, and made a determination based on his judgment that he did not need to be detained, unquote. Well, eight years after Sarah Root's death, the Biden administration has not learned from the Obama administration's failures. We saw these consequences just last month with 22-year-old Georgia nursing student Lakin Riley, who was allegedly murdered by an illegal alien who the Biden administration paroled into this country in 2022 and who was previously arrested in New York City for endangering a child. Open borders Democrats never seem to learn and the American people continue to pay the price. To my Democratic colleagues, I ask how many more laws with names of victims attached to them do we need to pass before you will take this crisis seriously? How many American citizens must die at the hands of illegal aliens before we all agree that these tragedies are all preventable? Must the name of my child or your child be the one attached to the next HR number before Democrats can vote yes on these common sense bills? How much more blood must be shed before we can all join in calling for an absolute end to the Biden administration's reckless open borders policies that are threatening our safety, devastating our families, and destroying our country? Enough is enough. Sarah's law closes a glaring loophole in immigration law by mandating that immigration detention for certain aliens like Sarah Root's killer who are arrested for, charged with, admit to, or are convicted of any crime that resulted in someone's death or serious bodily injury. In doing so, H.R. 661 seeks to prevent avoidable tragedies caused by illegal aliens and ensures that dangerous criminal aliens are more quickly removed from the United States. This bill doesn't address the entire immigration crisis in this country, but it's a key part of such reforms. I urge my colleagues to support Sarah's law honor its namesake, and take seriously the problem of criminal aliens victimizing our citizens. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the ranking member for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, let's be clear. Those who commit violent crimes that result in the death or injury of individuals should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. The bill before us today, however, will not solve the problem that the majority thinks it will, or claims to think it will. In fact, it might frustrate attempts by victims and prosecutors to seek justice. It also follows a familiar theme from the Republican majority, exploiting a tragic story with legislation that merely targets and scapegoats immigrants while doing nothing to address the situation at the border. The legislation before us today commemorates the tragic death of Sarah Root, who was killed by a drunk driver who entered the country unlawfully in 2013. Unfortunately, this individual never faced justice after a local judge released him on bond while the charges were pending. He became a fugitive, and ever since, Sarah Root's family has rightly sought justice for the death of their daughter. This case is a true tragedy, and I want to express my condolences to her family. But the legislation before us today would go way beyond addressing this issue. It would subject to mandatory detention any undocumented immigrants merely arrested or charged with committing an act that resulted in serious injury or death, along with those who are convicted or who admit to committing such acts. Like so many other bills we have considered in recent weeks, this legislation represents a gross overreach by subjecting someone who is merely arrested, who has never even been charged with a crime, to mandatory detention. 
As we have discussed previously, misidentification can subject someone to punishment for someone else's crime. Mr. Massey correctly noted in our markup last month that such punishments are imposed far more often on people of color. He praised Democrats for our consistency in supporting his bill regarding gun background checks, and I hope that we will find similar consistency on the Republican side today. There are far too many examples of wrongful arrests or charges due to mistaken identity or the use of flawed facial recognition technology. For example, Scottsdale, Arizona just had to settle a lawsuit for $200,000 in which a woman was wrongfully arrested for hit and run. Under current law, even mistaken charges can have devastating and long-lasting effects on a person's life and livelihood. We should not compound those issues by introducing mandatory detention into the equation as well. Moreover, I think my Republican colleagues have forgotten that the immigration detention system is by definition civil, and it should not be used in a punitive nature. A person should have their day in court first. Then, if appropriate, immigration consequences will follow. <coughs> <clears throat> to be clear, under current immigration law, being convicted of or admitting to committing a crime, involving, a crime involving moral turpitude in which the crime is punishable by imprisonment of one year or more already results in an individual being subject to mandatory detention. As a result, people who are convicted of or who admit to committing an act that results in serious injury or death are already subject to mandatory detention under our laws. This bill would not change that fact. But the breadth of this bill means that even innocent people will find themselves subjected to mandatory detention. Setting aside the due process concerns, this legislation would also have the perverse effect of depriving victims and their families of justice. Similarly, state and local prosecutors often express concerns that ICE will take custody before criminal proceedings are completed, which frustrates prosecutors, judges, and victims' families. If this legislation had been in place at the time of Ms. Root's death, ICE would have issued a detainer after her alleged killer was charged with a crime, and if resources allowed, it would have taken custody of him and then swiftly removed him from the country due to his previous infractions. He would never have been transferred back to local custody to face justice the way the Root family desires. This legislation is just one more example of the shoddy approach to legislating taken by this Republican majority in which headlines are more important than results. Rather than taking a careful and thoughtful approach that would avoid unintended consequences, the majority legislates first and asks questions later. I urge my colleagues to rethink this wrongheaded legislation and to work in a bipartisan manner on meaningful solutions to our broken immigration system. Thank you, and I yield back. A uh, gentleman yields back without objection. All other opening statements will be included in the record. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from California for the purposes of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Uh, the clerk will report. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 6. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman is recognized to, uh, the gentleman from California is recognized to explain the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment makes small technical changes throughout. It also requires the DHS secretary to issue a detainer for the criminal aliens covered by the bill, and if the aliens are not otherwise detained, to take custody of them. Uh, this amendment also expands the categories of aliens to which mandatory detention applies to include aliens arrested for, admitting to, or convicted of a crime that resulted in death or serious bodily injury. With left-wing prosecutors who may never bring uh, charges against someone, these changes are essential to ensure that there are new, no loopholes for criminal aliens or their far-left apologists to exploit. I'd urge my colleagues to support the amendment in the nature of a substitute to Sarah's law and yield back. Gentleman yields, uh, the gentleman yields back. The uh, who seeks recognition? Um, Mr. Van Drew, the gentleman from New Jersey is recognized. Thank you, Chairman. I know we've spoken about this ad nauseum, but it's an important issue, and I guess I just can't let it go. You know, we said on the other side that we're exploiting a tragic story and a tragic situation. We should, we're not exploiting it. We're trying to stop these tragic situations from happening over and over again. It's now become a familiar story. Left-wing prosecutors, left-wing attorney generals, they let people out after they've committed crimes, and unfortunately, in numbers of cases now, 
they commit the ultimate crime, whether it's Sarah Root, Lake and Riley, or Washington State Trooper Christopher Gadd. They've lost their lives. Condolences don't work. At the beginning of, this con of, of these debates, we're always, there's folks that say, I give my condolences, but we're not going to change anything. We're going to leave everything the same. We're not going to do anything. It doesn't work. It doesn't cut it. As we sit in our comfy chairs and we debate, people lose their lives brutally. And as lawmakers, there's simply no excuse for not enacting policies to stop harming Americans. But that's what this Biden border agenda does. When you allow millions of unvetted people to enter our country, when you don't know where they're going, who they are, what their intentions are, when you hamper law enforcement's ability to go after and deport lawbreakers, you are making Americans and America less safe, period. End of story. These people are here illegally. I don't know what we don't get about that. If anything, you have a right to detain them for just breaking the law and being here illegally. It shouldn't take a crime. But Biden and Mayorkas, they've bent over backwards to allow as many of these people into our country as they possibly can, and innocent Americans have lost their lives. This bill is just one more very good common sense measure to ensure that we are protecting our constituents, our Americans, and that we are detaining and removing the worst of the worst that are here illegally. We moved similar legislation, my bill, through this committee that would detain and deport illegals that assault law enforcement. I am with Member McClintock. He is doing the right thing. This bill is the right thing. We cannot overlook this. We can't pretend it's not there. We can't put a blindfold on. These people need to be detained, and they need to be deported. This is a time for choosing for all of us who are going to vote. You're either with the Americans that live here, work here, break their back here, and many of whom are legal immigrants who are here, or you're with illegal immigrants, some of whom are breaking the law, some of whom are committing the ultimate act of violence. I don't know. It's an easy choice for me. I hope it's an easy choice for my colleagues. I yield back. Uh, if the general will yield for just a moment. I yield. Uh, I, I just wanted to thank the general for his comments, but uh, also to give full credit to the bill's author, uh, Randy Feenstra. I'm simply carrying it here on the committee. Uh, he deserves the full credit for, for introducing this bill and seeing it uh, through to hopefully a, uh, a successful conclusion. I, I will reclaim my time and say on a, on a lighter note, you are one of the kinder, gentler, nicer people <laughs> that would actually do that. And I yield back to the chairman. The gentleman yields back, and I agree with his sentiments about the gentleman from California. Uh, and the gentleman from Washington is a kind person as well, and she is now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report. The gentleman from Florida reserves point of order. Amendment to the Without amendment. Objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentlelady from Washington is uh, recognized to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What happened to Sarah Root is a tragedy, and as a mother, my heart aches for her family. No parent should ever have to go through the unbearable pain of having to bury their child. Sadly, passing this legislation would not bring Sarah's killer to justice. Sarah's family was failed by the government <clears throat> on multiple levels, and in fact, I know that they've been going after the local judge in this particular case. Fundamentally, this is a problem best solved at the local level, where they are better equipped to avoid unintended consequences. Unfortunately, the legislation before us today is an imprecise federal bill that would make a massive change to the national immigration system. This sort of bill acts a bit like a sledgehammer, hammering away at the problem but causing an enormous amount of damage in its wake. Through this bill's extraordinary breath, it will put large numbers of people, including DACA recipients and TPS holders, at risk of being subject to mandatory detention even if they are innocent of the crimes of which they are accused. Like all of the immigration enforcement bills we have marked up so far in this Congress, this bill does absolutely nothing to fix the immigration system, and it has zero chance of becoming law. On the day before the government is set to shut down, this is not how we should be spending our time. 
We should perhaps be discussing the recent Congressional Budget Office's assessment that over the next 10 years, immigration is going to grow the economy by $7 trillion and increase revenue by $1 trillion. We could discuss how a new government study shows that refugees and asylees have a net positive impact of $124 billion over 10 years. But no, instead we're taking up legislation that has no chance of becoming law, does nothing to fix the system, and demonizes immigrants and immigration. The amendment I'm offering today would address some of the very broad consequences of this bill. Under the current version, someone can be subject to mandatory immigration detention simply for being arrested or charged with a crime that led to serious bodily injury or death. But as we have discussed in the previous bills that we've discussed in this committee, people are mistakenly arrested and charged with crimes far too often in this country. Do we really think that it makes sense to subject them to mandatory detention even if they were wrongly arrested and then exonerated? A mistaken arrest can be a huge burden on an innocent person. Just look at what happened last year in Kenosha, Wisconsin. An African-American couple was eating dinner at an Applebee's with their one-year-old son when the police came in looking for a couple who had just committed a hit and run. While the actual perpetrators hid in the restroom, the police violently arrested the innocent couple even while the father was holding the child in his arms. It took half a year in court to get the charges against this couple dropped, but the psychological and emotional scars from that, I'm sure, still remain. If this couple had been DACA or TPS recipients and this bill was the law of the land, they might be in immigration detention now even two months after they were exonerated. My amendment would also require that there be a conviction before the mandatory notification requirement under this, under this bill takes effect. Releasing this type of personal information to a victim's family based on a mere charge is extremely dangerous and it is not something we should be doing. Last month, we unanimously moved Mr. Massey's bill, H.R. 6824, out of committee. That bill is aimed at identifying and preventing the negative consequences of racially biased misidentifications in the gun background check system. I don't understand why we would want to move forward with a bill today that would amplify those same negative consequences in the immigration system. We passed Mr. Massey's bill in a bipartisan manner, and I hope that my colleagues are willing to work with us on this legislation as well. Unfortunately, without my amendment, the bill before us today has significant unintended consequences, and I would not be able to support it. I urge my colleagues to accept my amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back. Is there further discussion on the amendment? I will. The gentleman uh, withdraws his point of order. Uh, I'll recognize myself for five minutes. I, I, I would just remind my, my friend that uh, Lake and Riley's accused killer was never convicted of a prior crime. He was arrested and released by New York authorities. Arrested and released. Arrested and released. That's the Democrats' favorite pastime in our, in our cities that, that they control, and it's a principal cause of the carnage uh, which those cities are now suffering and uh, whose constituents are now starting to awaken to the damage of these foolish, foolish policies. We've been through this uh, discussion many times before on similar bills, but I'll, uh, since the gentlelady wishes to make her points again, I'll make my points again as well. I wish for a change that the Democrats would be just as concerned with the rights of uh, um, Americans uh, as they are with the rights of illegal aliens uh, and the crimes that they're committing in our communities. But let, let's just call this out real quick. Under current law, an alien already can be subject to mandatory detention without a conviction. We've gone through these examples many times, but somehow they just don't sink in. An illegal alien who admits to committing a crime involving moral turpitude, or who admits to committing a, 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 a controlled substance offense. Any alien, including a green card holder who, who commits a drug offense. Uh, all of these are subject to, to mandatory detention under current law. In 2019, the Supreme Court noted the, the expansive nature of mandatory detention. They highlighted that, that part of the reason for mandatory detention is to reach aliens who necessarily escape conviction 
uh, and uh, another part sweeps in aliens uh, for whom there is, is no reason to expect police, as opposed to immigration officials, will have reason to arrest. That's why we have these provisions in law. Under current law, even the spouses and children of certain illegal aliens must be detained if the DHS secretary knows or has reason to believe that a spouse or parent trafficked uh, drugs and the family members knowingly received a benefit, financial or otherwise, from that activity. So if it's the breadth the, of, of, of this uh, uh, policy that the Democrats are concerned about, it certainly sounds like they'd like to strike down the entire with, mandatory with the gentleman yield? section. No, not till I'm done. Um, uh, so, so again, you're, you're trying to, your objection is the entire mandatory detention section, which already it's, has been the law correct. of the land That's why and, I was and asking applied if to aliens for decades. Sarah's law makes so much sense that I think Americans would be surprised to know that it's not already the law of the land. Uh, this amendment would strike this, this provision, and, and, and uh, let me... Uh, would the gentleman yield? I just want to clarify something, well, let me, Mr. Let me Chairman. Raise one other, let me raise one other set of points first. Um, we, we keep hearing that, that, that these are illegal aliens who will be wrongly detained. But here's the reality. Aliens who are inadmissible for being in the U.S. illegally or lacking valid documents should have been detained once they crossed the border in the first place. And they should have been continued in detention throughout their immigration proceedings. That is the current law. And aliens who've had their visas revoked or failed to comply with their non-immigrant status no longer have a basis to remain in the United States. To, to, to even lodge a detainer uh, against an alien or to arrest an alien in the first place, uh, DHS has to have probable cause that the alien is removable from the United States. You know, once detained, if an alien claims he's wrongly subject to mandatory detention, he can request review before an immigration judge who will then determine whether the alien is in fact an alien, whether he fits within the category of mandatory detention, and whether DHS is substantially uh, unlikely to establish that the alien is subject to mandatory detention. All those rights are in existing law and all of those rights apply in this case. And that detention is far from indefinite. According to uh, data from the Executive Office for Immigration Review, uh, the median uh, case completion time for an alien in detention it was only 42 days in fiscal year 2033. Yet if the alien is truly innocent and, and wrongly detained, as the Democrats argue, then the alien can quickly receive asylum and be released. If the Democrats cared about public safety and the constituents they serve, I think they would reject the amendment and they would support this bill. But that doesn't seem to be the case, and I'll be happy to yield to the gentlelady for my remaining time. Uh, I may need a little bit more time, but I just wanted to be very clear about something. I am, I am granting that if somebody is convicted of or admits having committed or admits committing acts which constitute the essential elements of any offense that resulted in the death or serious bodily injury, I'm not touching that, Mr. Chairman. My amendment does not do anything with that. My the time. only You're claiming my time. You, you, you should at well, least understand that that, over, person, so gonna, that that person. I think your time is expired. That that person is subject uh, to, to detention anyway because they've committed the crime of illegally crossing the border. I, I think move further discussion. Process, point. process point here, Mr. Chairman. I think your time is over. Uh, by 10 seconds. Well, it was by 10 seconds. I know, but you I... interrupted me, but I'll be happy to recognize Ms. Scanlon now. Thank you, and I discussion. yield to the gentlewoman from Washington. Thank you. Again, I just wanted to make it clear that it is the case right now that if you're convicted of or admit to having convicted or admit committing acts which constitute the es essential elements of any offense that resulted in the death or serious bodily injury, you are subject to mandatory detention. What this bill does, though, it expands that dramatically. And it says if you are charged with or arrested for, and that is the problem that I have. That is why I am submitting my amendment, because I am saying just being charged with or being arrested for a crime does not mean that you should suddenly give up all your due process rights and be mandatorily detained. So I am saying, yes, I understand what the law says right now, but this bill is a dramatic over expansion and it fundamentally hurts due process rights. And frankly, it's, it's, uh, it's extremely dangerous because if somebody is just charged with a crime, 
or is just arrested for a crime, you're essentially saying that from that point on, they have to be mandatorily detained. Not only has no administration ever been able to mandatorily detain everybody that is that is uh, subject to mandatory detention right now, that's true of Republicans and Democratic administrations, but now what you're saying is we're gonna expand that population even more and we're going to mandatorily detain or require to mandatorily detain people who are just charged with a crime. And the reason I brought up Mr. Massey's uh, bill from last time is because we know that people are charged unjustly all the time. We know that that happens. And we need to be really sure that we're protecting due process for everybody. And I care about due process for everybody regardless of legal status. I care about due process for the people that are here in this country, making sure that we have the ability for people to go through that process. And so all, all my amendment does is say, let's make sure we at least have due process for people who are charged with or arrested for, but not yet haven't gone through the process, don't have a conviction, haven't admitted to having convicted. I don't touch any of that that's in your bill, Mr. Chairman. I literally just have an amendment saying, if you're charged with or arrested with, you should not be mandatorily detained because you haven't gone through the legal due process that you uh, are due for. So that is what my amendment is, and I, I reject the assertion that somehow Democrats want to uh, not adhere even to what is current law or want to allow everybody. No, we just want people to have due process, and what your bill does is expand dramatically and hurt the due process rights, including, by the way, of legal residents who are here, people who are in TPS, people who are DACA recipients, people who have legal, uh, the legal ability to be here. This is a real problem, and I think everybody, including on the other side, if you believe in due process, you should wanna, you should wanna support this amendment. I yield back to the gentlelady from Pennsylvania. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Is there further discussion, Mr. Biggs? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would have to oppose this amend, proposed amendment, and I'll tell you why. I'm just going to give three quick reasons. Number one, under Title VIII, someone who is not inspected and admitted into the United States is already subject to mandatory detention. Failure to detain those individuals is not, a viol is not uh, consistent with the law. It may be consistent with practice, but it's not consistent with the law. The reality is um, when an individual is released, instead of held mandatorily, we have found that we lose complete track of them. We don't know where they are. Um, so it makes almost uh, a charge like this to be, becomes almost a nullity. The third thing is due process. In, the, in most cases, um, if you are charged with a, committing a, a murder or uh, an aggravated assault, you will be brought before a court to determine your release status. Failure to have adequate ties to a community would be one reason why you'd be remained. Flight risk would be one, uh, another reason you'd be remanded and held. And I think that this bill, as it is, is consistent with the current due process uh, and the reality of the situation and also Title VIII. And so I oppose the amendment. Yield back. Could the gentleman yield for just a moment? So I'll yield, to, I'll yield to you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to, again, emphasize the point that, that, that you made. The, an illegal alien is already subject to mandatory detention under existing law. That law was ignored in the case of Sarah Root's killer. It's being ignored in the case of, of more than six million illegal aliens that this administration has deliberately released into this country and about whom we know very, very little. And the po fine point of the matter comes down to this. If this law had been enforced, or if this bill had become law, Sarah Root would be alive today. And, 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 and that's the bottom line. Uh, and I thank the gentleman for yielding, and the gentleman yields back, and the chair recognizes Mr. Nadler for five minutes. I thank the chairman. Mr. Chairman, this bill makes subject to mandatory detention anybody arrested or charged with, never mind convicted, of various crimes. That is opposed to the basic concept of due process. Now, some of the Republicans say, well, illegal aliens are already subject to mandatory detention, or ought to be. But we're not only talking about, but this bill is talking not only about illegal aliens. 
People who are here legally under DACA, for example, people who were brought here as, at, at, at two years old 30 years ago and are clearly Americans except in, in legal status, or TPS recipients. These people are here legally and yet would be subject to mandatory detention if arrested or charged with, never mind being convicted of or admitting to. That violates basic notions of due process. In addition to which, there's total hypocrisy. This bill will subject a lot more people to mandatory detention at a time when Republicans refuse to give the Department of Homeland Security the resources it needs to enforce the existing law. Congress has never appropriated, and no administration has ever requested sufficient resources to detain all non-citizens who fall under the mandatory detention categories. President Trump never tried to detain all migrants subject to mandatory detention. And this bill would expand who is subject to mandatory detention to people here legally who may never have committed the crime, who are simply arrested or charged with, and put them into facilities that we can't even fit all the people who should be in these facilities because Congress hasn't appropriated the money the Trump administration hasn't requested sufficient money. The Biden administration requested, I think it was $16 billion to increase this and didn't get it. So this bill would simply do violence to all our notions of due process and do nothing to help solve the problem at the border. We have a problem at the border, but it wasn't deliberately created by President Biden. It existed under President Trump. It exists under President Biden. Conditions abroad have increased the number of people who seek to come here. Conditions for which the United States has no responsibility. Climate change, uh, political violence, gang violence, instability. These are what drive people to try to, to leave their homes. Nobody wants to leave their home uh, where they've grown up unless circumstances make it necessary for them to do so, usually. So this bill is, does violence to due process, submit, subjects people who have not been convicted of any malfeasance of any sort to mandatory detention, and that does not increase anybody's safety. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion? Seeing none. Uh, the question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from Washington. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. Roll call, please. Uh, recorded votes re requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Isa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany? Mr. Massey? No. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy? Mr. Bishop? Ms. Sparts? Mr. Fitzgerald? No. Mr. Fitzgerald votes no. Mr. Benz? Mr. Benz votes no. Mr. Klein? No. Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Armstrong? Mr. Gooden? Mr. Van Drew? Mr. Van Drew votes no. Mr. Nels? Mr. Moore? Mr. Kiley? Mr. Kiley votes no. Ms. Hageman? Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran? Ms. Lee? Mr. Hunt? Mr. Fry? Mr. Nadler? Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren? Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee? Mr. Cohen? Mr. Johnson, Mr. Schiff, Mr. Swalwell, Mr. Liu, Ms. Jayapal, Ms. Jayapal votes aye, Mr. Correa, Ms. Scanlon, Ms. Scanlon votes aye, Mr. Nagus, Ms. McBath, Ms. Dean, Ms. Escobar, Ms. Escobar votes aye, Ms. Ross. Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivey. Ms. Ballant. Ms. Ballant votes aye. Ms. 
Mr. Fry, you're not recorded. Mr. Fry votes no. Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are seven ayes and 11 noes. The noes have it and the amendment is not agreed to. Is there further discussion on the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Seeing none, uh, the question is on the adoption of the amendment in the nature of a substitute. This will be followed immediately by a vote on the reporting of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the amendment in the nature of a substitute is adopted. The reporting quorum being present, the question is on favorably reporting the bill is amended. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. Uh, the ayes have it. The bill is ordered uh, to be re uh, roll calls requested. Uh, Secretary, call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Issa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock. Aye. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Roy. Mr. Bishop, no. Ms. Sparts, Mr. Fitzgerald, Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Bentz, Mr. Bentz votes aye. Mr. Klein, aye. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Gooden, Mr. Gooden votes aye. Mr. Van Drew, aye. Mr. Van Drew votes aye. Mr. Nels, Mr. Moore, Mr. Kiley. Mr. Kiley votes aye. Ms. Hageman? Aye. Ms. Hageman votes aye. Mr. Moran? Ms. Lee? Mr. Hunt? Mr. Fry? Mr. Fry votes aye. Mr. Nadler? No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren? Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee? No. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen? Mr. Johnson? Mr. Schiff, Mr. Swalwell, Mr. Liu, Ms. Jayapal, Ms. Jayapal votes no, Mr. Correa, Ms. Scanlon, Ms. Scanlon votes no, Mr. Nagus, Ms. McBath, Ms. Dean, Ms. Escobar, Ms. Escobar votes no, Ms. Ross, Ms. Ross votes no. Ms. Bush? Mr. Ivey? Ms. Ballant? Ms. Ballant votes no. What is her name? What, what, what is her name?
Mr. Gates, you're not recorded. Mr. Gates votes aye. I want to speak it on the record. Mr. Chairman, I know uh, this will be um, submitted when appropriate, but I'd like to ask unanimous consent uh, to submit articles regarding China Gibson uh, for the record uh, relating to the amendment to H.R. 7187 uh, and ask unanimous consent for them to be admitted when appropriate. We're in the middle of a roll call, but we'll work to get the material submitted in Thank the, you, Mr. At Chairman. the appropriate time. Thank you.
Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Moore, Mr. Moore votes yes. Georgia. Mr. Johnson, you are not recorded. Mr. Johnson votes no. Thank you. So we can report now. Clerk, clerk, clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 14 ayes and nine noes. The ayes have it and the bill is ordered to be reported favorably to the House. Members will have two days to submit views. Without objection, the bill will be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute incorporating all adopted amendments. And staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes. That will conclude today. Without objection, the documents identified by Ms. Jackson Lee will be inserted into the record. This concludes the committee's business for today. The committee is adjourned.